Grandma, can I have the chocolate chips? This secret recipe moment made possible by Emory Heart and Vascular Center. When Grandma needed heart care, she came to Emory. The difference? Emory Healthcare performs more heart procedures annually than anyone else in Georgia, which means better outcomes for our patients. And we offer advanced and personalized treatments developed by our top specialists that others don't. Like Grandma knows, where you start your heart care matters. Smart Cookie. EmoryHealthcare.org slash Smart Cookie. Bling Bong, everyone. Our new podcast miniseries, Talking Mission Hill, is now exclusively on Patreon. Put on your spicy pants every Friday with a new podcast covering each episode of the cult series from Simpsons Legends, Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein. $5 subscribers at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons can hear every episode, plus all of our previous miniseries about Futurama, King of the Hill, and The Critic. So don't be a Beardsley. Sign up for Talking Mission Hill today. Ahoy hoy everybody and welcome to Talking Simpsons, the podcast where we roll into a ball and stay in a ball. <laughs> I am one of your hosts, creepy little loser Bob Mackey, and this is our chronological exploration of The Simpsons, who is here with me today in the same room. Why, it's Henry Gilbert and Bob, I am ready to share with you my Savage Dragon comics. Oh, and who do we have on the line? Uh, my name is Nathan Rabin, uh, thanks for having me back. And today's episode is the Malcolm in the Middle episode, Pilot. My name is Malcolm you want to know what the best thing about childhood is? At some point, it stops. This episode aired on January 9th, 2000. And as always, Henry will tell us what happened on this mythical day in real world history. <gasps> oh, my God. Oh, boy, Bobby. 2000 is starting with a bang as Little Big Mom airs alongside this, that episode of The Simpsons mm. you heard two weeks ago, listeners. But at the same time, Six Cents and Big Daddy win at the uh, People's Choice Awards. And Janet Reno decides that Elian Gonzalez must go back to Cuba in this uh, this week in the news. I did not vote on those uh, People's Choice Awards. Mm-hmm. I was not even offered a ballot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are those still going? I, I feel, I wonder on those mm. People's Choice Awards. The, but... <laughs> the people nixed it. The mm. people decided that it was no longer their choice. Uh, they wanted it to not exist any longer. The Blockbuster Awards seemed the most valid to me, yeah, I think. Yeah, that was the voice <laughs> of the people. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I or think... the, the Guys' Choice Awards uh, from Spike TV. Oh, yeah. This... Very legitimate. Finally, there was uh, a voting for men finally <laughs> but, but then they took it away from us <laughs> but yeah i mean i think adam sandler won a lot of people's choice awards mm, at the time big so. daddy's where i checked out i <laughs> uh, wasn't a fan <laughs> of that well they, it's one of these less terrible movies i think it is just we both turned 18 this year in 2000 yeah Bob, so i think that is the cutoff for most people of just to, <laughs> tom sharpling had this great uh opinion about like oh when you complain about Adam Sandler movies like he'd ask people oh but you like those ones right <laughs> how old were you when you liked the ones you did like oh you were 13 okay well there you go <laughs> this one seems like uh, the one that Sandler fans would pitch to me as like no no it's more down to earth it's mm. more about you know he's growing up it's a little it's a little schmaltzier you know you know but then he goes on to make little Nicky right right after yeah, this I think so yeah. yeah I think I remember uh Big Daddy being egregious even for Adam Sandler and his product placement uh, a lot of uh, a lot of scenes had in Hooters oh, yeah. for some reason. And that movie gave us the the Sprouse Boys. Oh yes, yeah. An interesting uh, thing to bring up when this is all about child actors. This episode of Simpson, well, uh, talking Malcolm, I guess, or si- talking in the middle. <laughs> How about we call it that? Yeah. Uh, but hey, welcome back to Nathan Rabin, uh, raconteur, yes. professional writer, podcaster of Nathan Rabin's Happy Place, and the author of the Weird Accordion to Al, soon to be available in a new expanded edition. Oh, it's already available. Oh, okay. I, edition. You can, you can buy it from. My- my website uh, for cheaper uh, and you know you don't have to pay for the shipping and the handling and your taxes and whatnot uh yeah my website is nathanraven.com my name.com uh backslash shop uh, or you can buy it from uh, amazon and it's 500 pages uh because it now covers every single song and every single weird alien 
album and his entire TV film uh, and uh, a good chunk of his live uh, career. I wrote about UHF. I wrote about The Complete Al. I wrote about every episode of uh, Comedy Bang Bang and The Weird Al Show. My uh, goodness. That oh, a great, great deal uh, to uh, The Simpsons. And then I wrote about his big uh, 2018 tour that I went to uh, seven stops on. Wow. I had a really, really amazing, uh, amazing, amazing experience on that. And it's funny, actually, uh, when I uh, was working on him on Weird Al the Book, that's where we uh, began our professional relationship. He talked about how when he was working on Weird Al show, he was conceptualizing it. And there was an ambitious young animator who uh, who came up to him and pitched him uh, on a series of shorts about a, a, a an evil baby uh, and, and a sardonic, a hard-drinking uh, dog. Hmm. Uh, and Weird Al said, wow, that's a really, really good and nowhere near appropriate for a a kids show on Saturday morning and of course that young man was Seth MacFarlane uh, uh, and he was pitching the family guy and, and who knows Al could have you know been the Tracy Ullman uh, of oh, that wow. whole world uh, had he only been and the Weird Al show was great in part because it wasn't that appropriate for children uh, so this would have just been one more uh, egregiously egregiously unfamily friendly element uh, to his family show <laughs> Seth MacFarlane made Family Guy like three times before That's he true. made Family Guy. Yeah. <laughs> I think the other one was called Larry and Steve. Was it the Cartoon Network pilot? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, he... Well, he, he didn't really break through until he was like 22, 23. You know, mm. so a lot of struggling. Uh, a lot of work, a lot of... I, I feel sorry for him, you know. Just life <laughs> is very difficult for him. He's only got... 17 shows on the air some of them end after only three or four decades uh, i think we should have a go fund me he was rudderless for like two years after rhode island prep school it was very sad <laughs> uh yeah i think his situation right now is that he has three shows currently on television uh with fox but he also signed an overall deal with comcast uh so he he's actually making a shitload of money from two giant companies right now so well, i was I mean, with this whole uh, Squidbillies thing, a number of uh, kind of fascinating things about that. One of which is that Squidbillies has been on the air for 15 years. <laughs> question mark i find that very hard to believe uh you know squid billies it comes and goes i think it's it's whenever <laughs> dave billis wants to make more squid mm. billies <laughs> I, I think i just got news somewhere that there's a new seth mcfarland album coming out he's got like six uh, of them and they're uh, uh hasn't he covered every standard by now he's got to just be repeating <laughs> them at this point i i think like one vanity album is enough but he's making this uh just part of his life now and i mean it's it he gave his sister two vanity albums as well. I think so. <laughs> Haley sings. Yes. I would. Uh, I think it would be fascinating if they did kind of a meta move and uh, Seth MacFarlane put out a, a, an album of big band covers of uh, Doobie Cox songs. Oh. <laughs> it's entirely. I, I might actually buy money for that. Certainly not any of his uh, straight laced uh, uh, yeah. uh, you know, albums of jazz standards and whatnot. I'll take that over Irving Berlin covers any day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but Nathan, you know, uh, what what is your experience with Malcolm in the Middle in, uh, in this break of format we're doing here? That is a good question. My experience of that is that my wife, who is the mother of my two rambunctious boys, uh, she really, really liked uh, Malcolm in the Middle growing up and she always enjoyed it. And then I would sort of catch a bitches. <laughs> I would always get bits and snatches of it uh, at the end of, you know, when I was waiting for The Simpsons. And it was always good. It wasn't like, uh, you know, when I was waiting for Conan and I would have to endure three or four minutes of the Leno show. Every minute was like, oh, why, why, why? Whereas with Malik in the Metal, it flew by very quickly. And I'm like, you know, if I watch a show, I probably would enjoy it. But I just, for some reason, never got around to watching it until I had a reason to be professional obligation uh <laughs> and it's terrific i was very very impressed uh with the big knock in the middle television program now i hope we've uh we've turned you on to it more but even though you don't have a big history with the show we are going to lean on you for parenting observations yeah. in this uh, in addition <laughs> well, I have them. yeah definitely 
and and you know in addition to your general like extreme deep knowledge of <laughs> pop culture as well <laughs> there aren't too many punishments in this episode i don't think there are any like mm. the the show is famous for showing off the many punishments the children have to go through there's a mention of spanking yeah, they they speak to spanking but there's no creative like as i i watched other episodes i'm like there's not as much like physical things done to malcolm and the brothers as punishment because i think they knew like oh that looks bad to actually see a pair oh, like to see lois spank malcolm on screen that it looked bad but instead they just had like extreme timeouts yeah you know? <laughs> like, uh i i follow this entire series from the beginning i had really grown out of watching sitcoms despite growing up on them by this time but uh, i loved this from the very beginning and it felt like the path uh, to this for me was like the adventures of pete and pete and then strangers with candy and then this and then like arrested development for like high higher concept yeah. higher budget single camera sitcoms without a laugh track it feels like they're all part of the same like universe of uh, tone and theme and darkness and uh, a little melancholy in there as well well that timeline really matches up of like pete and pete kind of ended right when strangers of candy and it uh, began strangers of candy ends right around when this begins uh and then like three years into malcolm in the middle then arrest development debuts it's, so. it's like a passing yeah. of the torch and what i really like about this then and now is that uh, despite how cartoonish it is i like how it very accurately portrays a lower middle class family as someone who grew up with like very limited means the first 10 years of my life all the talk of like leftovers the state of the house the state of their yard it reminded me of my family and many of the families i grew up around uh very accurate in that sense and i do like seeing families depicted in this way where i feel like it's so rare to see a family like below middle class on television and it was even rare back then uh, despite like the wave of the roseannes and the uh, mm. grace under fires of the beginning of the decade 2000s were just like no everybody's rich we all have money <laughs> it's all gonna be great uh, let's forget about 2001 and what that will bring i grew up poor enough uh as that I'm like, but they own a house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for me, that was because, yeah, I also grew up in a, in a group home uh, for mostly disturbed adolescents. So I had a, a bit of a different uh, growing up experience than other people did. But mm -hmm. I also, you know, lived with my dad uh, when he was very poor. And yeah, there was always a thing where it's like, God, if you owned your own house, that kind of set you apart. Yeah, it feels like they are just on the lowest of the lower rung of the middle class where they can just mm -hmm. barely have this house. Yeah. And it's always just like we don't we never have enough food. They, we don't know if Christmas will happen. They have trouble paying bills. Like there's multiple episodes in the first couple seasons where it's like we can't afford this doctor bill like or yeah. this cancels a vacation because a person gets hurt. It feels like this is where the Simpsons started financially mm -hmm. and soon grew out of. But they were always stuck here. They never just forgot about the money issue and let them have crazy adventures. They were always like just barely hanging on by their fingertips. Well, it's interesting because the other is so much inherent drama and conflict in being poor and trying to get by in a world where you need a lot of money and yet you see it so rarely in mm. television shows and in sitcoms and I think it's just a measure of how much we hate the poor and <laughs> we don't yeah. even want to see them even if it's inherently easier to depict their lives as being full of struggles and conflict and things that you need to get over than people who are upper middle class which seems to be kind of the default uh, in television particularly in sitcoms. Yeah and the financial aspect I think really informs the characters especially Lois like that is why she is so fierce mm -hmm. and I think a uh, sitcom 10 years ago would portray her as like what a bitch mm -hmm. but this one is just like she is fierce and defensive and protective for a reason because like one of her children is the one that will save the family yeah. and she has to just keep watch over all the other freaks and they have to get by on so little yeah and yeah the I I think to the you know the class that it speaks to and how few especially just network or mainstream sitcoms would deal with class issues like this i think of uh dan Harmon talking about when he was making community and how he made it's not that show isn't a show about class but it is a show about like challenging viewers and he felt like uh you know some people get home from a really hard job and want to put on a, the tv to make them feel better for a little bit they don't want to be challenged and maybe they also don't want to see like oh this family also is incredibly stressed out by almost missing one bill or they're like you have to deposit this paycheck before you send these bills away because we are on the edge like that that kind of thing you know i could see it uh stressing out people uh in real life too my viewing history with this uh show is i did fall off in about the fourth season of show so but as 
I was watching Simpsons at the same time. I watched this every night when it was partnered together with it. And I think, uh, you know, if if uh, I don't I don't think we need to justify doing this in the show because we've done we've done Family Guy and we did Mission Hill as well. But this is a related to Simpsons show because it is the most successful in terms of ratings, the most successful show that ever got partnered with The Simpsons. And I think barring like a little bit where they went to Thursday night in the sixth season, Malcolm was pretty much always on the same night as the simpsons oh, yeah. on sundays like it was and as the simpsons was going even more into captain wacky town huh. in in the postseason 12 here's you know the malcolm in the middle being so grounded and real while also being funny like it does feel like in um you know a, a worthy successor to the simpsons that now the simpsons is outlived by 13 years but uh, you know and malcolm has uh, like kind of un uh, unwittingly assassinated all the animated shows that they're running because they're always yes. looking for an animated partner to the simpsons that wasn't king of the hill because that was already a hit and everything failed but this is what stuck and it was way cheaper than making let's say uh family guy mm-hmm. because family guy was not a hit it was only a hit when it came back thanks to the cartoon network reruns uh, but here, why don't we go into the history of how Malcolm in the Middle came to be and why it was partnered with The Simpsons. So the story of Malcolm in the Middle is the story of the show's creator, Linwood Boomer. And he <laughs> was he was born in 1955, so literally a baby boomer. He really wow. is. Hashtag OK Boomer. Uh, I was thinking of uh, <laughs> whoever heard the pitch to, to this to this uh, pilot was like, OK, Boomer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like where you're going. See, that's why in my notes, I constantly, I normally address people people by their last name in my notes but i kept having to go like just write linwood it's gonna yeah. be too distracting <laughs> to write boomer uh but so linwood uh was born in vancouver but his family moved to the bay area in the uh 60s and he was the third of four sons uh had a very strong-willed working class mother and uh, it was uh, it could be a tense situation of not you know being lower middle class kind of uh, kid there and he, with all those troubles linwood is then cursed with the worst thing imaginable the pain of being a gifted kid no I'm, <laughs> it's a pain i i know all too well yes yeah <laughs> uh as as recovering gifted kids me and bob know it's the worst thing you can be it's so it's not it's my nice. my imposter syndrome is terminal <laughs> i have a go fund yeah. me for it uh, literally it's not i should hear that i'm uh, one of those as well of, of course uh, that's why we're all hosting a podcast exactly. <laughs> yeah. gifted kids with it, podcasts are the are the curse of gifted kids uh, growing up yeah no i mean it's our revenge on the world uh, i mean look as a gifted kid i am tired of hearing people complain about the pains of being a gifted kid but it did come with its own like bullshit of uh, that is expressed through this show very well i think and it, it definitely it, when i saw this pilot i was like oh this really speaks to me as a i was just finishing my high school career as a gifted kid when this show debuted but yes the Lin, linwood's not faking it he's not stealing uh, valor here he's a real gifted <laughs> kid too but unlike malcolm he actually was even more antisocial and hmm. um and unpopular he tells stories about how being in the gift, gifted kid program made him a very antisocial teen who mouthed off to teachers and and uh, principals and didn't have a lot of friends he also went to an all boys catholic middle school where he had slightly longer hair hair than a uh, crew cut and so he was uh, mercilessly teased for that so uh sounds sounds like the recipe for a very surly antisocial young man in in Lidwood's life unlike malcolm he would not end up a valedictorian or going to harvard he actually would go to hollywood he would work in uh work his way up in acting very quickly to be cast as a recurring character in the later seasons a little house on the prairie wow he was like the husband of one of the girls on that show. Mm. Like when she got married on the show, she got married to Linwood. He didn't really have a big role after a couple seasons of Little House. He was like you on IMDb. It's like one episode of Fantasy Island, one episode of Love Boat. Like not not uh, stardom wasn't on his path. Little House on the Prairie was like the Waltons in that. If that was a rerun on TV, it would just go off. It would yep. go away. Yeah. I, it just put me to sleep <laughs> immediately. Uh, I like God damn it! Another Little House on the Prairie. There has to be a Lassie on at least somewhere <laughs> uh so linwood though makes a big career switch in the mid 80s he's gonna go behind the scenes starts working in sitcom writing his first credited writing gig is on silver spoons in 1986 and uh, from 86 to 88 he was a writer producer on night court 
wrote a number of episodes on that i on this show you can feel a little spirit of night court's uh wackiness i, I think, think so yeah <laughs> it's quirky i would use the word quirky to describe the shenanigans in night court and the shenanigans in malcolm in the middle and you know also night court was really driven by like great actors who constantly got nominated for emmys as well like you know what, what john laura kent was the brian cranston of his of the 80s i like, think so <laughs> did he make a dramatic turn later in his career you know i don't think he tried to actually he, he, well, no, the John Larroquette show is actually quite uh, acclaimed by Mark because it uh, sort of dealt with his real life alcoholism. Oh, uh, his character right. was an alcoholic as well. Uh, so yeah, that definitely was one where, and he's yeah, he's he's a really compelling actor. It's like one of the all time great sitcom actors. I would go so far as to say. That's why Arrested Development had that joke that Kitty met John Larroquette at AA. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he, uh, including in his tenure in Night Court, if you remember, I only know right, Night Court through watching it like 800 episodes in a row on TV and reruns, but if you remember a four-parter where Harry loses his job and is going to hang glide to the Statue of Liberty. Oh, yeah. that uh, He wrote all four parts of that. Wow, so. that was like Night Court the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Linwood also uh, is credited for the, as the writer on the first failed U.S. adaptation of Red Dwarf. Okay. He, he was the writer on that failed pilot. And uh, then he made his way up to executive producer on the first season of Third Rock from the Sun. Yeah. And uh, several longtime Malcolm in the Middle writers will have met Linwood there, and he takes him over to Malcolm. But that was uh, the closest he got to show running to that point in his career. Uh, and he bounced around some more after that. I don't know why he left after the first season of Third Rock, but uh, in the late 90s, he worked on his even animation. He worked on the Doomed the God, the Devil, and Bob show. Oh, we'll forgive him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just like any pro Bob show, though. It, I mean, <laughs> uh, they, they disparaged my name with that awful show. <laughs> <laughs> but while executive producing that show, he was working on a spec script that he didn't think would turn into a series. It was just something he would hope would sell him as a writer that could work on single camera sitcoms because he was working on all these multicams and you know single camera sitcoms they weren't dead but in the late 90s they weren't as big like i think the larry sanders show brought it back in a big way yeah the the sitcom boom was all like multi-cam audience mm. stuff Though, I mean, single camera sitcoms go back to, like, the Andy Griffith show. Yeah. Like, they've yeah. always been around, but they kind of got... Happy Days. First season of Happy Days. Oh, that's uh, right. With yeah. a single camera show. And actually, quite good. Like, the first season of Happy Days was substantially better uh, than all of the rest, in part because, yeah, it looked more cinematic and, and visually dynamic. And uh, so Linwood's spec script it came up with the idea of a, a boy not unlike him and a family not unlike his. The, the pain of childhood and plus the pain of raising a child uh, as a fun family sitcom that had a lot of bites to it. So that spec script is uh, getting passed around Hollywood, garnering a lot of interest. First of all, from UPN. This was almost a UPN <laughs> show. But Linwood felt that it was a bad fit from the start. He's like, uh, UPN has these notes. We don't like these notes. Then a company, Regency TV, gets interested in it. And not only do they get behind it, but Regency is also like partially owned by Fox. So mm. Fox is interested in it. And I did a bunch of executive talk in our uh, Family Guy podcast on Talking Simpsons. So you may remember Doug Herzog. Oh, yeah. The, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the briefly tenured president at Fox. Was former Comedy Central guy? The, the killer of MST. That's right. That's why I know his name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, he gave us South Park and he took away Mystery Science Theater. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Doug Herzog in his time at Fox, he loved this script. He made it a top priority. Uh, he also is working with Gail Burnham at the president of Regency TV, who Gail Burnham would go on to be an executive at Fox like by the time this aired. So there were a lot of good friends for Malcolm <laughs> in the system there of the executives. Also, like Linwood Boomer would marry Regency senior VP of comedy, Tracy Katsky. So uh, a little slightly incestuous production in Malcolm, but it's a good show. So, hey, I'm, I'm glad it exists. Uh, but so not only does Doug Herzog order a script to be produced as a pilot, but he makes a initial order of 13 episodes, which would actually grow to 16 episodes 
by the time the first season is finished. So Linwood Boomer gets put in charge. It's his first time as showrunner. He has a very strong vision for the show because it's based on his childhood. So uh, I, I like I found articles from when the show debuted of the other writers going like, boy, it was really hard at first to capture his voice because it's just like, how do you write for a guy's mom and tell him like, no, your mm-hmm. mom would say this. And <laughs> <laughs> but one important person in defining the show beyond Linwood Boomer was director and co-executive producer Todd Holland. Uh, mm. Todd Holland was coming fresh off of Larry Sanders. He's still a very in-demand director. Uh, and he's one of the, like the pioneers in single camera direction in the 90s for television. It surprised me that he is the director of The Wizard. That is very strange. Yes. Sure. Yeah. He, in that, I believe within the same 12 months, The Wizard was released and then his episodes of Twin Peaks he directed oh, were released. So, okay. <laughs> wow. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. He goes from like a commercial to the one of the weirdest shows in, in they ever broadcast on networks. Uh, he also directed Krippendorf Tribe. Yup, yeah, boy. <laughs> he's, TV is better for Todd Holland, I think. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he directed the pilot and many other episodes and really shaped the voice and shooting style of the series. I mean, I think he's the one who, you know, we mock The Wizard, but that is a film about directing a lot of kids. That's true. Uh, who, and including, you know, ones who have special mental powers. Uh, is Dewey the equivalent of the, the Wiz in The Wizard? I think he's more of like <laughs> a feral child yeah, yeah uh so it was originally announced for a fall debut but fox bosses which then included gail burnham they decided that they were going to save malcolm for a mid-season debut which was a bigger deal in 2000 and you know in the same class as this year of production Fox also bet big on action in very similar way. The show Action that is about Jay Moore oh, yeah, making yeah. Uh, movies with Joel Silver. And it's that show was like, what if we put an HBO show on Fox? Oh, people think it's too cruel and mean and heartless. <laughs> uh, that show's okay. It, I mean, that show. I, lo- I love action. I am on, on the record thinking that is an awesome show. And then incredibly dark. If you uh, watch for, the, the series the finale of that show is about how Harvey Weinstein is a monster. Ooh. Like that is, it is entirely about how awful he is, which it's one of those things like, wow. So action could talk about that in 1999, but in 2016, we had to act like who knew this about Harvey <laughs> yeah. Weinstein? Who I think there are also some dirty rock jokes about him being a monster. Oh yeah. Like, wink, 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 wink. Oh my God. No. <laughs> so Malcolm in the middle, it gets the, big boost of being put in probably the best slot you could be put on on fox television sunday night between the simpsons and x-files mm, perfect like, you cannot ask for a better slot than that and and its debut audience would be 23 million viewers and the next episode 26 million like that's how huge it was bigger ratings than the simpsons like it out through the simpsons from from the start wow uh and so uh, let's talk about the cast on the show uh a lot of them were relatively knew uh originally the character of malcolm was written as a nine-year-old but when they met a young frankie munez they're like no that's him and he can't play nine he's 14 and he can play 12 but he can't play nine. agent cody banks himself he this would be his launch into superstardom like and i think they were incredibly lucky with him as a child actor because it's like you are the anchor of this show you have to do a ton of dialogue that can't really be like hidden by editing sometimes you have to like talk to camera and then turn back like a lot of and that it has to be produced in single camera format too which actually is like even more like time consuming and taxing like frankie Muniz really he got uh, nominated for an emmy in the like third season and i think he really did like earn it and uh, he'd, he'd done a lot of small roles prior to this uh but this show would make him a superstar of the agent cody banks franchise <laughs> and also uh <laughs> battling paul giamatti and big fat liar all right He'd make appearance in other stuff after this, but he's much more into uh, car racing now. There's a crazy tweet I found from him of saying that, like, he's maybe the last person Dale Earnhardt ever talked to because he, he drove the pace car at the race where Dale Earnhardt would crash and die. Oh my and he, god. And like, he wished Dale Earnhardt well right before the race and then he's and then he's like, Dale Earnhardt then got in his car and we the, never saw him again. The famous Malcolm curse. <laughs> 
Uh, and also, uh, you know, sadly, in 2012 to 2013, he had a series of strokes and other brain injuries that have now left him saying that he has no memory of ever working on the show or much of his childhood. That's so tragic. Yeah, like, the just all wiped out. Yeah, just gone. He's like, uh, he appeared on, I think, Dancing with the Stars and just admitted, like, I don't remember anything. I, wa- I watch episodes and I'm like, wow, that was me. Now, of course, also, yes, Frankie Muniz since 2015 has come out as a staunch conservative i do wonder if the horrible brain injuries and that are related i don't know it makes it hard to like there's lots of republican celebrities that i would say to like scott Bayo, like h or whatever but i just can't for munez his brain i feel bad for him i i don't know oh, i i had no idea and now i'm utterly disillusioned he experienced yeah. a great amount of but trauma he played such a smart character on television i, I know what happened what happened <laughs> I feel like Malcolm could have just become Ben Shapiro in the future. Mm, yeah, actually going to Harvard at 16 is what uh, happened to Ben Shapiro. They, I bet I bet Ben Shapiro watched the show and he's like, hey, that's me. I'm this kid. <laughs> well, if you listen to Adam Carolla, a lot of his politics come from being very angry at his hippie mother. Mm, uh, so yeah. no, I mean, childhood resentment can lead to some pretty dark places as an adult I, he can finally yeah. punish all the poor people he had to grow up with <laughs> and malcolm uh, uh, becomes an adult he was surrounded by all these lazy people and now he can finally punish them yeah now i think i have to say i'm looking at his twitter account and it's not like uh offensive okay it's not like uh blood and soil maga stuff mm-hmm. but i mean he is a conservative but he's talking about wearing a mask so he's got that going uh, for him at wow, least that that what a low bar and he loves his wife (laughs) he's a wife lover he's a wife guy wife guy uh but so that's the lead boy in the show the other kids include oldest brother francis played by christopher masterson who is a scientologist uh but seemingly uh from my research seemingly uninvolved in anything related to his brother danny is in prison now right or he's been arrested i think he's the trial it's the reason why you're not seeing this at that 70s show anywhere right now that's right yeah yeah (laughs) but uh but yeah christopher masterson they they were at fox really investing in the masterson family like quite a lot and and you can assume that a lot of the success of malcolm in the middle brought millions of dollars to the church of scientology so (laughs) Uh, but probably less than my name is earl i bet my name is Earl funded more stuff in the church of scientology Mm. but anyway sorry this is just a bum out here (laughs) um (laughs) then there is the next oldest brother reese played by justin burfield uh he's a really good actor too he's actually a few months younger than munez though he you know he Mm. can play his older brother he definitely is bigger than he is uh he was fresh off of the ripoff of married with children unhappily ever after that's right created by one of the creators so he was ripping himself off (laughs) so he was the bud bundy on that show oh you're right yeah Yeah. i do like how all of the brothers are so different from Mm -hmm. each other too they're very distinct and i uh, we're gonna talk about dewey but yeah a lot of his stuff is a little little too cutesy sometimes but i do like how just like the state of the family informs the character so well and that dewey is like a feral child because like there's no time to raise that one yes yeah (laughs) he's just like left to his own devices just shoved to the side by his older brothers yeah i uh so justin bearfield he is hasn't acted in a while and that is because he is a production executive at the television arm of virgin like i sir richard branson makes some movies and he like movie 43 is a virgin production like (laughs) but that's so weird to me like how do you go from being a child actor to then an executive at virgin with having no other tv i just don't Hmm. understand it did he go to school or anything like business Uh, school i don't know i i i don't know he he produced a jessica simpson's vehicle a direct video of jessica simpson's vehicle in 2007 her Hmm. take on working girl blonde ambition he was like 20 years old (laughs) yeah that's crazy yeah Uh, they're through max keeble's big move captain writer romance and cigarettes okay is this the right person he's a it's awesome. it's an interesting life he's had well meanwhile yeah. yes the youngest brother dewey is played by eric per sullivan he basically vanished from acting after malcolm in the middle like he he has a credit in a 2010 film hasn't been seen in anything since i couldn't hmm. find any like where are they now article saying what happened to him he's just gone like there's there was a hey all the actors were in the same place let's take a picture together thing everyone was there except for eric per sullivan hmm. 
like mm. uh, the Reese actor is just holding up a photo of him like he's here in spirit kind of thing and it I mean it could just be like yeah he left Hollywood which you may as well be dead if you do that <laughs> apparently he's not dead but his career is uh, <laughs> but that's the kids the real star of the series though is the mother uh, Lois played by Jane Kaczmarek yeah and both of these actors the parents they were working for like 20 years as actors before this being their big break it's crazy it's amazing you look at their credits and it's like you know girlfriend in this double appearances on murder she wrote for the crayon man like he's like a tennis hunk in that yeah that's right yeah he's they're all in a million things because they were just working actors in hollywood waiting years to finally land a starring role in some sitcom and uh jane kasmerick a very decorated actress by that point in uh she was also at the time and for several years married to bradley whitford uh they they divorced about four or five years ago but no I, disillusioning. well for a time they were the kings and queens of network television because they got cast within the same week on their shows she got cast on malcolm in the same week bradley whitford got cast in west wing west wing would premiere in the fall of 99 malcolm was january 2000 but produced pilots at the same time and also in the first season jane kasmerick is pregnant which they cut they film around pretty well oh, okay mm. and uh and she would be the most celebrated actor on the show uh she was nominated for an emmy every year of the show but never won it Aww. she never yeah. won the emmy which she's a susan lucci of the uh, sitcom world I and it's too bad like she lost to there's two times she lost to Patricia Heaton where I'm like you know what no Ooh. no I don't think so this is not a judgment of her politics I think Patricia Heaton's fine on everybody loves Raymond but she's she's way better Jane Kaczmarek is so much better at basically the same role. yeah like uh, a much angrier wife <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, but unfortunately uh everybody loves Raymond is a real nemesis at award season mm. for, for Malcolm in the middle it wasn't just Jane who got screwed over by it but but she She's really the star of the show like she's the soul of the show they she can be this you know strict enforcer when she needs to be but when you see her like in the second episode called the red dress when she's she just wanted to wear a nice dress to her anniversary dinner with her husband and it's it's taken from her she only has so many nice things yeah you know? i mean despite the marketing for the show being the moms are real you know what uh <laughs> like the show has so much sympathy for her uh as a person i think it's it's very it could have gone a totally different direction too by making her a true villain but they have so much sympathy for this character even if you're a viewer you're like oh man she went too far that time yeah and, and you get a moment of her going like maybe i did go too far uh but and uh since the show though she uh has kind of, kind of been choosy with her role she does appear in stuff but it's like one-off appearances here and there not really starring in anything i mean she doesn't need to this show was made i'm sure made her very comfortable uh and at the same time the show was going on she did make eight eight appearances on the simpsons as judge Constance Harm, the uh, one of their their new judge character, their Judge Judy character. Oh, definitely, of the 2000s. yeah. Yeah. Did Brian Cranston go on to do anything after Malcolm in the Middle? You no, know, I don't think so. I don't. He, okay. just, uh, he wasn't. He's not that good of an actor. <laughs> I probably shouldn't point that out here, but yeah, that does not surprise me. Worst part of the show. Yeah, no, but okay. <laughs> yes, I, Brian Cranston was hired for a quieter role that would then expected like you see him in this pilot here hal is kind of a very just reserved like nothing guy yeah. yeah he is like the checked out father who wants to like just you know escape responsibility he would later become like a total goof vamping goofball yes. very actually very soon <laughs> after the quickly, pilot yeah. yeah well i mean he's introduced the naked having his back shaved yeah. <laughs> that's a an audacious way to introduce a character and be an unusual way to introduce a character especially your dad and uh brian cranston at the time he was coming off of memorable appearances on seinfeld twice on there's the converted to judaism doctor or dentist i, well, I mean they're doctors but you know uh, <laughs> they're tooth doctors also around the same time he did a couple voice appearances on clerks the clerks animated series it's funny hearing on the commentary on clerks they thought he'd be their harry shearer but after two Ooh, recordings right. he's like i you know i got on this pilot and they're like good luck loser <laughs> i remember this is so weird i remember on the dogma commentary ben affleck talks about uh going home to watch malcolm in the middle and everybody thinks it's bad oh kevin wow. smith scott Mosier, they're all like that show sucks damn 
Maybe yeah. they were just mad about Brian Cranston leaving. I think they're just mad about the Cran man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And also, like, he was so on the fringes in Hollywood before getting cast in the show. Like, he would do non union anime dubbing. He did, <laughs> he's in a Power Rangers episode voicing something, not on screen, just as a voice, which would lead to him being in a, a Power Rangers movie as Zordon. But, uh, and- although he, it, it says here uh, that he was in Saving Private Ryan very impressive uh his character is war department colonel so when you don't have a name probably not that good of a role it's funny that for a time him and dean norris were on the same level of acting and stuff Mm -hmm. uh but but yeah so as the writers would tell it in the writer's room they created a challenge of like what will brian cranston say no to because they would write (laughs) very crazy things for him to do like get him basically nude and covered in blue paint yeah he's fine with that rollerblading to funky town yeah have him do an entire (laughs) rollerblading routine and uh they said that when they wrote in the script that he would be covered in bees and he accepted to do that the writers said they're like we have gone as far as we can we will kill him and he won't say no so uh so yeah if you see him in this first season wearing being covered in bees uh, know that he said he was only stung once. He it was uh, he, he turned out okay. Uh, I also found some interesting article from like 2003, which was basically about how Cranston constantly was not getting nominated while Kazmarek was for like three years in a row. But it was an article that honestly felt like publicity for him, where it was like, but Brian Cranston isn't bothered at all. He's a very understanding <laughs> actor. Uh, but he eventually did get nominated a few times and never won it he uh the cran man he lost to brad garrett twice oh come on oh lord he lost to jeremy piven oh. and, uh, oh. the only person he lost to i'm not bothered by is david hyde pierce because david hyde yeah. pierce was overdue for yeah. one as well good stuff i was actually a day one breaking bad viewer because i heard like oh the dad from malcolm in the middle is in this crime uh show i'd want to see that like i wanted mm-hmm. to see where he was going to go next i think breaking bad in the casting it was i mean it was super smart he was so ready for the role but i think it did trade a little bit on like oh the, yeah his his history as sitcom dad well, i think they wanted the two actors they wanted for it were uh, matthew broderick mm. and uh, john cusack uh both of them interesting choices for it but yeah definitely uh, brian Cranston brought something to the role well uh, and he just well, owns he owns the character of walter white so much i think honestly i think the show to an extent was too reverent of what brian cranston wanted the walter white character there's a few to I'll, I'll just say no if you've seen breaking bad if you haven't seen it, i won't spoil it for you but i do <laughs> take i treat the final episode as non-canon i i do i know that's a lame fan theory but i do treat it as as a dream it it gets a little crazy <laughs> you know it gets to like an insane pot boiler uh they kind of yeah they heat things up to to delirious levels Though I think Cranston is very invested in his character. Same with Hal on this show. I think he he brought a lot to the character that wasn't there on the page originally. So he's he's used to doing that as an actor. And so, yeah, I mean, now pretty much um, if there's ever going to be a Malcolm in the Middle revival, it will be because Brian Cranston wills it to exist, like in that he's the one who sells it. Uh, one other actor I did want to mention in the in the group is David Allen Higgins, who's not in this episode, but of rules. the Higgins boys and Gruber. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was that the Comedy Channel, or was that the Ha, or was that the very early? Uh, the Comedy Central. That's think, when they had the two fused. They did two things that were kind of terrible and made something mediocre out of it. Yeah, I think that was the early days of Comedy Central. I recognized him from uh, Ellen. Yes, yeah. He, or These Friends of Mine, whichever version of Ellen he was on. That's right. Yeah, I forgot he was he was key in one of the early permutations of whatever the Ellen show was. The, he was like the bookstore man, right? The, the Ellen show was five different shows. Yeah. yeah. But Dave Allen Higgins, his brother Alan Higgins, wrote for the show he was fresh off of news radio going from news radio so i think dave allen higgins is also in some news radio and of course he co-wrote the wrong guy with jay kogan mm-hmm. a, a true cinema that classic. Is a very memorable 
total uh, sporting performance in it. And that is our Simpsons connection. Uh, Jay yes. Kogan, I believe, was showrunner of the last few seasons. Yeah, so you got Judge Constance Harm and uh, Kogan was near showrunner, okay. but they, they, it was a different showrunner. But and he wrote a few, too. Yes, yeah. Uh, so the first season was the best performing of all, setting records for anything airing next to The Simpsons. And also it, it was the only new show from that season on Fox that got renewed. Huh. Every other show canceled. <laughs> And uh, it's also interesting that the entire first season was produced before it aired. Uh, so Ooh. they couldn't take a bunch of notes or make a bunch of big changes to it as it went because it was just all in the can. And uh, the ratings were very good, but there was just a steady decline season by season. And of course, happens in all live action shows and not to The Simpsons. People age and change, especially all the cute kids you yeah. hire for your show. There's a ticking clock as soon as you have a show full of children. And like even mm. in the second season, like everybody's in puberty. Like just wait one year. Like I, I think Malcolm ages a lot from the pilot too. I don't know when they shot the pilot compared to the rest of the series. I mean, for a growing boy, three months changes a lot yeah. of things. Yes. Malcolm yeah. seems much tinier in the pilot. <laughs> He kind of, he kind of looks like like a fetus. <laughs> He's that small on this first episode. And and Linwood Boomer he even cops to it in interviews of like, look, we we wanted this to be about little boys, but when you see how they look at the end of season two, you realize you have to write them about middle schoolers and how they are interested in girls and all that stuff. It's it, you just have to write for what they. It'd be silly to pretend they aren't adu- they aren't growing boys. Unless you're Gary Coleman or Emmanuel Lewis, mm. and then biology has given me a weird out on that front. One, one of those uh, perma children, yeah. they don't make any more. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and also, as the show went on, Francis kind of just went away. Like, uh, Masterson just, you know, wasn't on the show as much. He the, After the 100th episode or so, he starts to go away, and his stories, uh, the Francis stories go away. That's a, it's a brilliant device, though, just a built-in B story, just like, well, well who's going to do something else? Oh, yeah, the character who's not on the show yeah. is going to have his own adventure. <laughs> you know, he does his own thing somewhere else, and it also made it an event whenever Francis was with the brothers in, like, two episodes a season. It's like, and, uh, and Linwood Boomer was showrunner until the final season, when he was like, finally, like, you know, my kid, as he put it, I had to step away before my children got so old they hate me and I could just spend time with them. Uh, he left uh, Matthew Col- Carlson in charge for the final season and he hired on Jay Kogan and several other mm-hmm. writers in, in co EP and EP positions running the ship, you know. I think the last season gets a little in wacky town and shows they ended it at the right time. Like all the boys were getting too old, but what are we going to do? Have a season of Malcolm in college? Like, no. So they, uh, it ends with this graduation, right? That's right. Yeah. The episode's called graduation. Boomer comes back to direct that episode and really shepherd the finale. And it's a, it's a really good finale too. And so 151 episodes, quite a long quality stretch of stuff for a live action sitcom. Um, you, you don't normally get uh, the final episode would air on May 14th 2006 uh, and making it honestly a blip compared to like Simpsons or Family Guy like even Family Guy has outlasted it uh, I think by like three times as many seasons by now or even like American Dad or Squidbillies yeah. <laughs> where it comes yeah. back to Squidbillies but <laughs> 15 years is a long time to be on the television Mm -hmm. yeah uh and uh the weirdest thing though is the for the show compared to simpsons is it only got one season put on dvd in in america anyway yeah i I bought that dvd way back in the day and uh i I didn't even know more didn't come out i guess they were just like well uh only certain things can make the dvd cut this is not special enough so and in season two did come out i think in some european territories and i believe it really the one source i read said it came down to music rights it's just Uh, this, yeah, this show has hmm. too many songs and watching this on um, Hulu. I was surprised a lot of this music made the cut. Yeah, it's uh, I guess they found a better deal for uh, digital than they did for DVDs back then. Like in the in the early 2000s, it seems like, well, the Simpsons will sell enough to pay for every song and license every song. Malcolm doesn't sell hmm. enough. So they I think they did in the first season. They had every song. They didn't make a cut of a song. But then by the second season, like we're not we're not cutting songs and we're not paying for songs. I saw on Twitter today, not even looking for it. Someone had retweeted a uh, Disney Plus 
Plus saying, you know, we have Malcolm in the Middle too, but that is not on Disney Plus it's yet. Not, no, <laughs> yeah. It was in April 2019. They said it would be part of the shows on Disney Plus. And I think at some point, unspokenly, they made the decision that there is a certain level of crudity that they will not put on Disney Plus, which is why mm. Simpsons is that line. Simpsons, mm. I think, is as far as content is allowed to get dirty wise on Disney Plus. And that's really just because Disney Plus needs a killer app. So they got Simpsons streaming. And but, it's an institution, too. Yeah, it's it they gets away with things. Other things wouldn't. But like Family Guy, X-Files, Malcolm in the Middle, majorly popular things that could be on Disney Plus, but they are doomed to the dirty town of Hulu. Where's my episodes of Ned and Stacy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I find that when you can make billions of dollars off of something like having The Simpsons on Disney Plus, uh, people don't care about morality that much. No. It's just, oh my God, money, 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 money. Malcolm in the Middle, unfortunately, is not that big of a cash cow to get past those. But so there's always been teases of revivals since the show ended in 2006. Uh, but the closest it came was a cute fake ending to Breaking Bad that Brian Cranston did, which uh, with Jane Kaczmarek came back. And it's, it's basically Hal and Lois wake up new heart style in a dream of like, oh, the whole show was a dream of the character <laughs> of Malcolm in the Middle. And that's only on the Blu-ray set or whatever? Yeah. I mean, it's on YouTube. You can find okay, it yeah. too. But yes. Yeah. So that was the closest. And I mean, it was cool that Cranston was like, yeah, I'll just do it again. He loves... He clearly loves this a lot. Anything he could get Kazmarek back for the joke is great, too. Well, I, uh, I've i seen... Uh, <laughs> I've seen Brian Cranston as a way too enthusiastic guest on the Elf talk show. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that they did with Ed McMahon was the uh, was the sidekick again because they offered to pay him money uh, for that role. And then he was also in the, <laughs> the least reputable of the vacation movies. It was a Thanksgiving vacation movie where he was kind of the Randy Quaid crazy character. And I think Judge Reinhold. Uh, was the uh, was a Chevy Chase figure. Okay, so, when you said Judge if, Reinhold. If you're in those two projects, huh. then you're probably going to do a whole lot of things. He, he seems pretty much up for anything. It sounds uh, like part of the uh, Vacation Extended Universe that was yeah. airing on like Showtime yeah, or something. Sure. It's Thanksgiving Vacation, yeah. If you ever want to be insulted, have your intelligence and judgment and taste insulted, go watch that terrible television movie. I've heard the observation that Brian Cranston is now so far above his station now that in he's he gets drunk on power and makes wild choices. <laughs> like, uh, or, or I heard again. I'll just say Tom Sharpling is very funny. He had this observation of like Cranston when he was doing interviews about his Power Rangers movies. Like you know, actually, I'm trying to bring a lot to the role, and he's he's talking about his process of playing Zordon, and, <laughs> and Tom Sharpling's like, just take the money, just enjoy. <laughs> like it's a big paycheck just do it I, i'm used to brian cranston being much older and craggier so seeing him here as a like a young man of 45 i'm like he is incredibly <laughs> handsome yes yeah he really is uh but but yeah so that is malcolm in the middle they've been teasing more to come but not not so far but uh but all right why don't we take a break and when we come back we'll go through the pilot episode of malcolm in the middle This is Malcolm. He's a typical run-of-the-mill genius. He has an IQ of 165. Who? Malcolm. What? Where do you think that came from? In an average, ordinary family. No! From the network that brought you The Simpsons. On paper, this was a great idea. Comes Malcolm in the Middle, premiering Sunday at 8.30 on Fox. Welcome to the break, everybody, and I won't repeat the question. It's Henry Gilbert, and thanks so much for listening to this week's special installment where we cover the Malcolm in the Middle pilot. And a big thank you to our guest, Nathan Rabin. Be sure to check out all the cool stuff he writes at Nathan Rabin's Happy Place and check out his new paperback edition of The Weird Accordion to Al. And much like Nathan Rabin, this podcast is also supported by wonderful patrons on patreon.com slash talking simpsons that make it able for me and bob Mackey to do this as our full-time jobs where we not only where we cover the simpsons related shows like malcolm in the middle and also our weekly what a cartoon podcast where we cover a different animated series each week 
You know, if you sign up for five bucks a month at patreon.com slash talking simpsons, you get access to all of our podcasts a week ahead of time and ad free, plus tons of exclusives. If you sign up now, you get to hear all of our previous Patreon exclusive miniseries where we cover shows like Futurama, King of the Hill, The Critic, and Mission Hill, all in the Talking Simpsons style and only for our Patreon supporters. And coming in October, we're going to be doing the second half of Futurama Season 2 only for our Patreon supporters. So please consider signing up today, five bucks a month at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. But if you're ready to go the full Krellboyne level at patreon.com slash talking simpsons, you need to check out the $10 a month bonus, the what a cartoon movie. You get all that $5 stuff if you're a $10 and up subscriber, but you also get our monthly what a cartoon movie where we cover a different animated feature film in the same talking Simpsons style, often for over four hours. You sign up now, you'll get to hear September's what a cartoon movie which is the aladdin sequel return of jafar plus all the previous ones which include films as varied as beavis and butthead do america space jam the ghost 1995's ghost in the shell the black cauldron and tons and tons more please consider signing up at the ten dollar level to get the most out of your subscription at patreon.com slash talking simpsons All right, we are back, and now it's time to talk about the pilot episode of Malcolm in the Middle in particular. Uh, this It's a really good pilot, though there's lots of stuff in it, I think, that breaks that would be like, oh, they wouldn't do this on later episodes. Yeah, I feel like they're being a lot more brash up front. Uh, like, all the parent nudity, I don't think it extends beyond this episode. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, multiple articles from 2000 were about Linwood kind of defending the parent nudity about how he's like, well, that was my family. We were just like, my mom walked around topless sometimes. Uh, My dad would get shaved in in front of us. Like it was, it wasn't, he's not saying it was like even good, but it was like, it was his childhood growing (laughs) up. I think it fits with the kid. Like they're just too busy for modesty. Just like, I don't have time for modesty. I'm kind of watching this thing about sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, and how if you're very wealthy and you have privilege uh, and entitled and whatnot you can think about the abstract things but when you're this close to the bottom when you're so concerned with just getting by every day you can do without a whole lot and i feel like that includes clothing yeah. uh and again i think that captures the sense of uh perpetual low level desperation and chaos and anarchy that comes with being the parents of rambunctious boys <laughs> Uh, but uh, apparently other writers were like, oh, we're kind of disturbed by this. We're not doing this as much <laughs> in later episodes. <laughs> Though this opening voiceover thing, this feels a little tacked on, like, for clarity. of like, I think the show could just start at the breakfast table after the opening. Though the show always had uh, cold opens. Yeah, so, yeah, you know. usually unrelated. And it does set up, like, the, the economic state of the family, that all these boys share a room and a bed. Mm, yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, that was true. Like, when I was uh, well, of limited means, I shared a room with my mom mom for like four or five years and then when we moved to a house i'm like i get a room i can have a room that's mine <laughs> that it, it speaks to like a family that bought a house for one when they're like yeah we have one kid one bedroom for the kid cool yeah. and then they couldn't go to a bigger house when they had more kids so like look you you three boys are just in a room together like deal with it and there will be another child before the end of the series yes uh, and also they have a quick note about francis just so you know he isn't there i sometimes i wonder with how francis is like cut away to i wonder if they like recast with masterson after the pilot or something there's mm. i don't know mm. I, I couldn't find a story about that maybe he was always there but it feels really not the character of francis feeling inserted but masterson's parts feel pretty inserted to me it does uh it was at the the season of uh Three's company, uh, where Susan Summers was off being wildly successful. So she would call in to the show. That's right, yeah. And, and that was a way to technically have her be part of the show and have her still remain and 
clearly just spend 10 minutes uh, shooting your stupid little bits separately from everybody else's. It was ahead of its time. I mean, every sitcom now is going to be a Zoom meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't bring myself to watch the new Hulu show, Love in the Time of uh, Corona. Seems uh, too dark. I, I, you, I'm living it. Don't, don't you want to be reminded of COVID-19? <laughs> Oh God! I want to see what quirky <laughs> situations will arise from it. Sorry, Henry. Yeah, no. I mean, the, this <laughs> next this next decade is just going to be. We had to watch movies about nine eleven for fucking twenty years <laughs> after nine eleven, and now it's going to be this. Everything yeah. will be in reaction to this. After not to not to diverge us too far, but it's just like, yeah, you made your horror movie. That's fine. I don't want to be reminded of this when it's over. I want no memories <laughs> of this. I never want to think about it again. Uh, boy, but feel like Men in Black, and just make everybody forget uh, the. Yeah. Eight months that this nightmare <laughs> will exist for. Uh, well, let's talk about a happier thing. They might be giants. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had this whole song on a cool CD I drove around listening to with anime music as well. <laughs> Very popular in college. Uh, yeah. The, I mean, again, as we're all white and nerdy, gifted kids here, I'm sure we all love They Might Be Giants growing up. Oh, definitely. This is just so perfect. You know, it's one of those things where it captures the tone of the show. It captures the, the essence of the show. It captures the humor of the show. It's just the perfect table setter for what's to come. And this is not the uh, official intro. This is the one on the pilot. The official one has clips of anime and wrestling. Yes, yeah. And and it's faster, too, yeah. the song. It's they, uh, What I had forgotten was that they didn't just do the theme song. They were the composers for the first season oh the, i forgot about that the score of the first season is by they might be giants and uh while this show uh opening was so popular it got they might be giants their first grammy and it was easily their most successful song commercially i read a 2002 interview with them where they are as being as nice as possible of saying this job was awful and we hated doing wow. it. Wow. Like they, it, uh, they, they said it was very emotionally taxing and difficult. And apparently it was like, as people scoring the show, they didn't have control over their music. It was just to the demands of someone else. And they also mentioned like, they had been a band for 20 years and now they have a boss for the first time <laughs> in their life. They have a boss and, yeah. Well, I, weirdly enough, I think I mentioned this possibly the last time that I was here, but it always makes me think about Warren Zevon uh, sort of late in life. Things weren't going so great for him, you know, until he found out that he had that fatal illness, and then he had his big comeback. Uh, but at one point, he was reduced to doing the incidental music for Tech War, oh, uh, which was William Shatner, the, the William Shatner novels that he wrote, mm -hmm. uh, ironic quotation marks. Uh, so yeah, I, I just imagine being a genius, genius, genius like that. And I'm like, well, what music should, you know, uh, accompany this laser gun fight? <laughs> So yeah, it's not not always the the most exciting or, or satisfying creative gig in the world uh, doing music. Well, we all got to learn about tech work sometime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I think they, they never came up in any of the interviews I read. But I think hiring they might be giants as your you know initial co composers for your show that really has a Pete and Pete vibe to me. Like they had Polaris do bu a bunch of songs yeah, for the show, not true. just uh, that. And it is a show about kids speaking to the camera and addressing the audience and lots of fun yeah. cutaways, single camera stuff. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think there's more than a little that they, they don't ever speak to it in any interview, but I yeah. do think there's a little Pete and Pete in this. In fact, it's not. A, this is not a ripoff or whatever. But I know like at least one Pete and Pete opens with like a shot of the earth and talking about like how insignificant we all are oh, yeah, in the grand exactly scheme of the things same. yeah, yeah you're right. yeah you know what that opening with all the clips in it let me identify each oh, source good. in here <laughs> uh so if you see like the three women with the giant turtle and some of the other caveman stuff that is from the 1966 film one million years bc when you see any anime character in there uh it's from the anime which was fairly new at the time in 1998 nazca n-a-z-c-a -A. i can see, see that villain smiling right now in my head <laughs> and uh, uh and the skateboarding too yeah uh, yeah and uh when you see the kraken come out of the ocean that's from clash of the titans the 1981 movie uh, the mud monster grabbing the woman that is from creature from the haunted sea of 1961 uh, the 
skiing guy covered in flames that's from the 1999 film thrill seekers uh if you see the robot head being put together that's from 1965's out of the unknown the man beating the brain monster with the axe is from planet of the brain from planet Oris in 1957 wow. and uh two more from not from movies the boxer getting knocked out knocking out the referee that is pedro cardenas fighting willie dewitt but he accidentally ko's referee bert lowes that's from the 1982 north american championships and finally henry's time to shine that is a wrestling match from wcw's world heavyweight championship match from wcw mayhem in 1999 oh fairly new then and that match features bret hart versus chris benoit oh wow Ooh, so yes. in every intro of malcolm in the middle of chris benoit is there yep wow he's always there the it's bret hart is putting the sharpshooter on chris benoit so you can't even really tell it's him it's just him on his back only if you're a super fan of wrestling who in 2000 was a huge chris benoit and bret hart fan you're like oh my god my favorite wrestlers are in a thing being sung over (laughs) by they might be giants how great and uh yeah the show's last episode aired uh, 13 months before chris benoit's murder suicide thing so oh my goodness yes yeah but that well, thanks for once again bumming me out <laughs> bringing everything down <laughs> sorry so sorry. much tragedy now we know why it's not on disney plus uh that's true yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh but but shockingly i think they signed the deal they must have signed the deal with wcw to have it in there and it just persisted because of, or maybe they had to renegotiate it because that footage is now owned by wwe but it's still in the malcolm opening but anyway okay that's the intro dealt uh-huh. with now why do we play our first clip uh and it's about shaving walter white <laughs> who to sock it to who to sock it to stop it <laughs> there's only two toaster waffles one of you has to have cereal you are mine come on give it you cheated give it give it huh. look at this they're sending an unmanned probe to venus and letting a bunch of school children name it well, that's gonna end badly. They do this every month. He has sensitive skin. The hair gets itchy under his clothes. <laughs> you know, I think you can wear underwear while your wife shaves every other thing, and then maybe in the maybe you both just go to the bathroom after <laughs> and shave the genital regions. This brought me uh, memories of my mom uh, like shaving my stepdad's eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, man, my my family did not have. Uh, we did our shaving privately. We're very <laughs> not, private. Not people. open grooming. No. <laughs> but yeah, like the upfront, it's like all the kids sleeping in the same bed. Uh, food is an issue. There's not enough food to go around. Oh, sorry, Nathan. I'm just saying that I feel again. I feel like you know when you have your first child, you're like how life is perfect and ideal and pleasurable and educational and wholesome as possible. And then by the last kid, it's like eh, they have whatever's around. Mm-hmm. you know whatever we are using personally is is down to that you know and I, also i think it's very observational that uh francis is the fuck up because he was the first kid and they had no idea what they were doing yes yeah <laughs> they, they made the most mistakes with him yeah <laughs> well and i also love the that you can see the hierarchy right there when just through their lack of means she says like yeah we didn't buy enough toaster waffles we don't have enough for three toaster waffles you each waffles. get one waffle yeah and then a third kid is is not going to have it and she's she's not telling dewey you don't get the toaster waffle but she denies it if he's denied it just because he is kept on the outside by his two larger brothers uh so the hair all over brian cranston that is yak hair he is not really that hairy and it's actually the uh, the hairy back is from a crew member who uh, uh, had, had that who elected to have his back shaved on television i figured it was a stand-in and uh, on the season one dvd there is a slightly extended version of the pilot it's basically two minutes longer the biggest change is that in the pilot they did a scene the scene is lois singing i believe in miracles instead of it's your thing hmm. so i i don't know why it was it was two different maybe songs. they couldn't clear it for tv i guess so yeah but, but then by the time the dvd comes out they're like you know we will pay for i believe in miracles <laughs> and also there's uh, there's a lot of stuff with dewey in here where he just is weird i feel like their original jokes are a little ralph wiggum with him 
but his character grows so much more and in at times he's written to be smarter than malcolm i think in the series or or more conniving i think a better a better planner and uh yeah they just have to see their father's like hairy junk even <laughs> as he which uh so so gross but uh then we find out that malcolm is having to go to a play date which it's a very 1999 joke to mock the term play date is fruity and this this is all filmed in a real house the show always tried to film in real places instead of in uh on sound stages i like the state of their uh the exterior of the house and the yard as well Mm -mm. very very uh, true to life though apparently they got a different this is a slightly different house than uh the other seasons they after the pilot i think they couldn't get the same house but it's in spirit the same house which is just a constant mess just destroyed a place of chaos and the second season finale it's the great like series of flashbacks of each child being born and you see how the lie their lives and home were ruined (laughs) like made worse each child's birth Stevie comes up for the first time as Malcolm's forced upon best friend in this next clip. First off, I don't even know Stevie. I saw his mother at the grocery store. She said you boys ate lunch together. One time. He rolled his wheelchair over next to me. It's not like I could say go away. He's not even in my class. He's in the crow blind class in the trailer next to Tetherball. You listen to me, young man. That one lunch obviously meant a lot to Stevie. He's a human being with human feelings. Now, you are going to be friends with that crippled boy, and you're going to like it. Understood? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Understood. If I give up now, I won't get to lecture. You kids, you just take your legs for granted, you know, like nothing could ever happen to him. Well, let me tell you something. That is just wishful thinking. There's meningitis. There are car accidents. I could be giving you a spanking and accidentally snap your spinal cord. Every day is a lottery, and first prize is that you don't have to scoot yourself around town on a skateboard with your hands. You think about that. I don't take my legs for granted, Mom. I know, honey. You're a good boy. Stop playing with yourself. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great Uh, way to get out of that scene. Yeah, it's uh, that does also feel very real of like kids are gross and you need to tell them to stop (laughs) doing those things. Uh, This also brought me back to, I guess we can now be nostalgic for the year 2000. It's bizarre, but it's just like all the fashion, like all of the clothes are at least Mm. two sizes too big. Every neck is a V-neck. Everything has a stripe on it for some reason. All pants are built to hold cargo. Yeah, it's uh, such a 2000 uh, show. I, I, the fashion. Well, is- the, the, well, the thing about 2002 is that you kind of have the worst fashions of the 1990s and the worst fashions of the 2000s. Definitely, kind of like this middle point of like all of the worst. And like, what was going on? How did anybody have sex? <laughs> it was such astonishingly unsexy. Astonishingly, I, I gotta just feel like the whole world was norm core uh, from like 1990 to like. 2003 and we still dress poorly but we and i get to remember like at the time like looking back at the 70s and 80s i mean like those people dress silly and now i look back and i'm like oh my god we were literally the worst of any generation <laughs> we were like all dressed as skaters for some reason i never yeah. skated uh i just bought some new vans for the first time in a while and it took me back to wearing skater shoes while not owning I, a skateboard i see cargo pouches on henry shorts right now look these are henry the- it's 2020 <laughs> we need to okay look intervention it's a, time it's a hot day here <laughs> i nor i I never I'm you know I'm a jeans wearer most of the time but the only shorts I own are cargo shorts when did you buy these shorts uh like two years ago. okay they still sell cargo shorts yes yeah they feel these also have drawstrings that I can tighten them up if I want to but but uh so uh the character stevie too he's he's based on linwood growing up uh that his mother made him hang out with a boy with cerebral palsy mm. uh who mm. would become a very good friend of his at which he was like my mom was right uh, like that's 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 what stevie's based on though stevie i like that stevie is you know they they get some special kid jokes in there but uh, i love how on the show uh, they navigate all this stuff of like stevie is an african-american boy in a wheelchair and how do you joke around that like how, what do you do with that it's like and i feel like sort of the uh, impulse for every other show would be like okay this is a character uh he's black he's in a wheelchair uh how do we make him as accessible and easy and and and, and appealing and relatable to a, a mass audience as humanly possible and they don't do that they make him an actual character mm. you know there's an actual uh pathos to it and furnished of it uh, and some of the language that's employed here there's some a- ableist slur then again in, in 2000 i think we're, we're treated much more different uh, mm, yeah. differently you know and again i feel like this this weird paradox where they're 
a number of moments where I'm like, yeesh, I can't believe they said that. But at the same time, it's such an empathetic, it's such a sensitive, it's such a nuanced depiction. I, also, it's just, it's rare to see disabled characters on television at all. Yeah. Let yeah. alone a, a disabled character who is black and a nerd as well. And every single part of his identity, you do complete justice to, you know, and is complex and interesting and has so many different dimensions to him. And those are my children screaming <laughs> outside. It's my like door. we're living an episode. Uh, because yeah. their, their father is abandoning them. <laughs> Harris, I'll come out. I'm sorry. Um, so I think Lois lo- using that word. Uh, is the joke that she's yeah, like, you should have all this empathy for this kid who I view only as his disability in an insensitive way. And I think yeah. it helps that he has like, he just basically has a mystery disability. Not, they don't ever say like, this is his condition. Mm-hmm. It's like he just has a vague disability. But he's also one of the smartest kids in school too. So yeah, it's, uh, well, in the name of the class, the Krellboyne class though, yeah, man, his Jersey accent on Mune is really is, is it's big strong. in this episode. But the uh, it's it's named after Rick Moranis's character from Little Shop of Horrors, uh, Krellborn. No, so it's a cute little reference there. But uh, uh, then, as the kids go off to school, we get a fun visual gag of like every person who lives next to this family ha- is trying to sell their house and leave. Just like a number of realty signs as they're walking to school. I mean, these are the bad neighbors who are like this fucking kid destroyed my backyard again. Like <laughs> uh, they are not invited to anything. And yeah, the joke that Dewey like needs to be watched and he wet his pants and all this stuff that also feels like you know he's supposed to be a Ralph Wiggum type mm. in, in these early episodes he's he's much more needy in this and I think they figured out like he's like super independent yeah. and, and super smart mm. because he has no supervision so he just turned super independent there's in that bowling episode which is one like maybe the best episode of the series an incredibly like high concept sliding doors kind of thing uh, in that one Dewey is shown to be like a man master manipulator but only through like soft application like not even through words just gestures and uh and yes as they're walking to school uh a kid a boy named richard brings up francis and uh, i don't think that richard character ever really returned no i don't think the bully character comes back either i think at least in his case it's implied that what happens at the end of this episode Mm. is why he never comes back i mean if you're not committed for series for the pilot these none of the other kids were tamped down to be recurring in the show they they got other jobs child actors are in high demand you know but we do get an introduction to francis which is a a clip i can't really the the audio of it doesn't really make sense without the videos but it's really good like the the series the continual monologue that isn't interrupted of francis doing different crazy things that got him in trouble and all just saying every time like oh i learned my lesson yeah the car on fire is the escalation of all of that and i like it's like it wasn't even our car yeah come on who cares yeah it also felt like kind of an arrested development gag too like ahead of arrested yeah, yeah. development mm. and uh, and i'm also kind of surprised they got away with a character named spath not spaz mm. that, that also ableist word we were but... saying that on, on tv in 2000 though oh totally that is true although i did like there were some lines again just uh it's a very very audacious pilot uh one of my favorite lines in there uh when he's talking <laughs> about how he's adjusting to military school and he says between that and the general ad- atmosphere of simmering homoeroticism <laughs> yes. uh, things are looking up and again I just love how in 2000 that is very audacious mm-hmm. to concede that a, a military school for teenage boys is going to be a raging cauldron of homoeroticism and to call out and acknowledge it up front instead of pretending that that tension is not there and I, and I also like that Malcolm, when they pass by the co- the bully, he's like he never goes anywhere. Like his he is so mad that the unfairness of Francis got punished with all this, but here's this shitty bully who everybody knows is mean to everyone. I also like his you know very evil pitch of like you must pick two, but if you take all three, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> and that's your best value for two like, weeks. <laughs> yeah, again, a very evil capitalist in this show as well. And also, it's a funny little gag of him going like. Wait. No, never mind. And he just starts pounding the kid off screen. <laughs> then there comes a classroom scene, which uh, all I now just see it as like, boy, all these child extras like got to be expensive. Yeah. This is why he goes to the gifted class yeah. with fewer kids. Uh, the actors playing his regular teacher, 
uh, in the pilot is Marin Dungey, and uh, she would appear five times on the show as Stevie's mom. Oh, so okay. Recast. It, yeah. If, uh, I believe this. Yeah. They don't write Stevie's mother to also be a teacher, so I believe she's supposed to be a different character. It was a good commentary. Even in the plush days of the year 2000, schools were still, uh, you know, scrimping, scrimping and oh, saving. Yeah. Teachers are bringing in their own supplies. I love I love those jokes, but they make me sad of like, oh, it's actually far worse for teachers now than it was in 2000. Uh, and that's not even yeah. talking about um, risking their lives uh, at every second there in the school right now with uh, poisonous children. <laughs> and I, again, I, I liked how it was sort of understated as a matter of fact, all of kind of the jokes about her life as a teacher being kind of crappy, you know, and about like the little things that bring you joy. Uh, and yeah, again, I felt that that was very uh, subtle. She says, you know, I have to say this is the high point of my day. How is that for sad? And again, it's just, it's it's a very human moment. And this says a lot about the character. It's too bad they didn't bring her back because it's it, there's a lot of specificity and a lot of humor and a lot of pathos to this character who does not have a lot of uh, time or space on screen. They, they do get a lot of poor teacher jokes out of his his gifted teacher as well mm -hmm, yeah but yeah the i i think too what took her away she probably would have had more appearances on the show but she got cast as a semi-regular on alias uh like oh, yeah. in 2002 so she she yeah. i think that took up most of her time uh actually i have the clip of his his regular teacher she's pretty funny those of you finished with your tempera paints may bring your work up here and start on your charcoal still lifes. You may take two pieces of fruit only, and please be careful with them. I bought them with my own money. My own money. <laughs> God, Mouth, you look so good. <laughs> oh, Malcolm, this is wonderful. The perspective is good, the composition is clean, and it even shows signs of actual technique. I have to say this is the high point of my day. <laughs> How's that for sad? <laughs> <laughs> that also that she, t it says something about how empty her life is that she's saying these things to the kids. Cause it's like, do you, you have no one at home to say this to perhaps? <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, too, that uh, the little blonde girl, uh, do you recognize her, Nathan? You might, I think you've come across her in your, uh, in your work in Nicholas Cage films. I, I probably have, but I'm, I'm totally blanking on it. Oh, right what is this? Uh, well, in the film Con Air, if you remember ah. Nicolas Cage's character, Cameron Poe, he only wants to get home to his daughter. <laughs> I just ah. want to know my daughter. And that That's is her. her. Landry Albright is her name. Hmm. Uh, she's also in uh, the Ron Howard Grinch. She's the flashback oh, version of Christine Baranski's character. If you remember seeing the little Grinch and uh, how he has a crush on a girl, that's her. I wish I could forget. <laughs> yeah. That shaved that was, that Grinch. Was, that was a particularly terrible part of what I hold as the worst movie ever made. Wow. That all of his problems were due to like a shaving incident when he was a child. That was really weird. Yeah. Why was it shaving? Why else? Oh. <laughs> well, they improved on Dr. Seuss with that very necessary backstory. We need lore. Yeah. <laughs> Seuss needed more lore. Uh, what a hack. I mean, the 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 cat, the cat in the hat movies though must be is worse than Grinch though. Grinch uh, at least has like no, better. No, no, the the cat in the hat movie at least is surreal and weird and like very druggy and like why is Paris Hilton here? Whereas the Grinch that stole Christmas is like makes you hate movies, makes you hate capitalism, makes you hate Christmas, makes you hate <laughs> life itself. And it's also just unrelentingly ugly. Like I I will I will watch a cat in the hat. 10 times in a row before I would watch The Grinch That Stole Christmas. Scene. If you close your eyes, the Cat in the Hat movie is the Coffee Talk movie as well. <laughs> yeah, it, can, sure. it can serve uh, uh, dual purposes. But, I, but I'm but i so enraptured going through the Grinch Town or Whoville on the Universal Studios ride. Oh, man. Like, uh, oh, that place has seen better days. <laughs> Though the Grinch and Cat in the Hat, one's got Alec Baldwin, one's got Jeffrey Tambor. Who's the worst of the two? Mm. It's hard to measure. <laughs> though, you know. But unlike a lot of the kid actors in the show, Landry Albright actually is still pretty active as an actress she's uh, not in any major roles just like one-off appearances here and there or here and there but she was in an episode of picard last year hmm. so you know still still at it yeah 
But yes, as Malcolm goes back to his seat, he gets a very like 1960s prank of paint put on a chair. I guess little kids could still do that yeah. today if, if teachers pay for paint to give to little boys, I guess. Uh, but I also blame the teacher, though, that she just lets him walk around in his red pants instead of like punishing someone. I, I guess, you know, she's busy, whatever. That but. sounds like work. <laughs> uh, and uh, then we meet a, another recurring character for the first two seasons of the show, uh, played by Catherine Lloyd Burns. Uh, her character gets written out in the third season. I think they had bigger plans for her because she's yeah. in the intro to the show. But yeah, my favorite stuff with her is when she she thinks she's like this same savior of children but she's actually just incredibly naive and and let down by the system at every turn but she she totally came into being teaching as like oh i'm gonna help all these kids and then it's just disappointment after disappointment wearing her down uh but uh, she gives malcolm a gifted test which i remember the only thing i remember about my gifted test was they have a bunch of little toy colored bears around and they're like mm. how many yellow ones are there it was like a test to count something fast and i do think i had some sort of like what's different in this picture thing or i was shown a picture but that's all i can remember from my gifted uh, test that got me in but this this felt familiar hi I'm Carolyn. Want to have a seat? Are you Malcolm? Yes, and I didn't do anything. You're not in trouble, Malcolm. You're here because some of your teachers think you're... Um, you know what? I just want to play some games with you, okay? Puzzles, stuff like that. Why? Boy, oh boy, you are a suspicious little... <laughs> <kid answer. laughs> okay. Now, you can look at this picture for 60 seconds, and I want you to tell me everything that's wrong with it, Okay. The man only has four fingers. Right. But this time, I want you to take your time and really look at it. The car's shadow's going the wrong way. The steering wheel's on the wrong side. There's no brake pedal. The words in the mirror should be backwards. The guy's watch wouldn't say 12 o'clock if he's looking at a sunset. And I have red paint on my ass. That's right, red paint all over my ass. Kid swearing is also a big part of the show. Yeah. And I love his uh, New Jersey ass. It, it's such a Jersey ass. <laughs> yeah. That it's, I mean, I feel like in 2000, I was still shocked seeing on network TV a, a little boy saying ass. Mm. But uh, but it's so realistic. There's a good joke a little later in season one where the relaxed swearing of the boys happens at the dinner table where Reese just says, damn, <laughs> and everything just stops. And, and Lois goes like, all right and she just grabs dishwashing liquid and pours it in his mouth and she's like all right spit like that's uh, they, it it shows that the kids do relaxedly swear until they get caught in front of their parents doing it which also feels very real real to me well and i also like one of the things i like about uh frankie mina's performance is that he always seems angry yes yeah he's not cute you're not supposed to even like him sometimes he's just like fed up like all right fine what do you want like he's just screaming all the time i mean i feel like uh, no, this is not like an attack on his looks or anything but i, th I feel like they chose a non-cute child mm. to be in this role on purpose I, th I, think he, I think he's a cute kid i think his uh his dialogue and his personality and his attitude sort of work against that because yeah i definitely you want to pinch his cheek but again <laughs> i think it, it's true to the character that he just seems frustrated and angry and kind of put upon all the time which you would be if you lived with a bunch of kids and you went to the school and everything in the world seemed designed to aggravate you hmm. And I can identify with this frustration from my school days of like, uh, look, I know this already. Can we like, let's f speed yeah. this up, guys. I Just uh, finishing a test and then having like 40 minutes to kill. Yeah, I know this is bragging about like yeah. being good at school, which who cares? But yeah. <laughs> I, I can identify with that frustration, which then actually makes you into like kind of a very annoying person to everyone around you. And I don't, you know, I don't blame some of my bullies. I, I was probably a little annoying. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I do can, blame, I I do blame, uh, I blame other bullies. Sure. That's uh, actually a friend of the show. Scott Gardner from Podcast Variety had this story that was incredibly familiar to me of having a teacher in school, like in elementary school, telling you to like, hey, 
just tone it down just a little bit because yeah. <laughs> you're just too uh, excitable. Like, but I have to tell everybody about everything I saw yesterday. And, and it's only to help you from not being picked on as much, but you can't understand Again, it at the time. We all became podcasters. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The next scene starts, uh, it goes to commercial break. We come back. Our first scene with Stevie, uh, played by actor Craig Lamar Taylor, who I believe is able-bodied and he's, he's playing a part here. There's one really weird thing late in the series where he's able to walk because they like make pneumatic legs for him or something. Mm. So the actor gets to walk around. It's, I, I haven't seen the episode itself only the clip in and it's very weird looking uh out of context but i think too like what a challenge for a young actor to be like you have to do this like speech impediment that is all about timing i apparently if you look real closely this pilot was not filmed entirely knowing it would be in widescreen later mm. so you can spot the director directing stevie out of the corner because uh, just his timing has to be so precise for for this joke here and uh i also do it's a very dark joke they make but i do love that the reaction malcolm has is just like you have all these problems and your parents won't let you watch tv oh how horrible <laughs> I love the quote, television makes you normal. I love that. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, there are two, two lines, one of which is he says, my mother uh, says that television makes you stupid. And then Malcolm says, television makes you normal, which are both very weirdly incorrect uh, sentiments. Uh, and, yeah, over the course of his music, you find the idea that television makes you stupid uh, and that television makes you normal as an American everyday uh, average citizen uh, kind of at the same time and just sort of how television is at the center of all of American life <laughs> particularly if you're a kid in the year 2000 oh yeah like uh, when I was a, a young Malcolm uh, when, f when I was like a free range child my parents were too busy working to like set boundaries so like if I would go to a friend's house and they had like TV rules I would mm. be like oh my god you poor thing yeah. come with me <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll watch Ren and Snippy we'll watch Beavis and Butthead it's all happening at my place <laughs> You can see on the show, Malcolm is the kid that the other parents are mad about. Like, by hanging out with my Malcolm, you get to break the rules I set for you, and I don't like this. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, you have to... You, how do you exist in American society if you don't watch television talk about what is on television? You you are fully ostracized from it. It's, it's the same of, like... I don't know. I think parents, I've heard parents today say like, how much do I expose my kid in childhood to like iPads and computers and stuff? Because they're going to need to have these skills to exist in society. But I also feel weird exposing them to this so early. It's a tricky, it must be a tricky balance well, as, a, a, as a parent these days. Oh, totally. Well, just to also, I mean, just in terms of like on um, the latest incarnation of Elmo's world on Sesame street, uh, they have a character named Smarty and she's a, smartphone and she teaches you how to look things up on the smartphone Whoa. and part of me when i first saw that being like philistines well you should be teaching about books and whatnot They're like no actually in terms of 2020 like media literacy like googling is a very important skill to have uh it's way more important than a bunch of other kind of drier things so it does make sense to teach kids how to uh, sort of access resources and technology more effectively i i'm, uh, I'm shocked know, to learn of smarty this is this I, is crazy news to yeah. me. i mean all of our all of our education uh, we're we're a bit younger than you nathan but all of our education did not account for the internet no, like none of it did. it was yeah. just happening as henry and i were leaving high school but they're like ah forget about that it's it's not uh, reputable <laughs> you won't need to use that yeah uh, well, I mean, I learned about computers when I was a kid, but it was because the world of word processing will be changed forever by computers. Nothing else. Think of the banners you, you could will... print. Yeah. Uh, so this next bit here, though, is when uh, Stevie and Malcolm really connect over uh, a love of mine as well. A frock. Goes into a box. You want to watch TV? <laughs> Can't. <laughs> Not allowed. What? You mean ever? Mom says TV makes you stupid. No, TV makes you normal. How can they do that? He's in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So what do you do all day? Homework? Mostly read comics. You have comic books? Whoa! You really 
have young blood number one? Wanna read it? No way. I'd wreck it. Oh, did you read the last Savage Dragon? When they split him in two? Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. I like how we never have to learn a lesson or anything. He just gets <laughs> down on everyone. All image comics too. Yeah, yeah. That I really noted that that they. I wonder if they tried to go to Marvel or DC and they wouldn't allow it. But in this case, they like image was like, hell, you take every comic. They are comic names. I also love that it's real comics. They didn't just make up some. Every sitcom would just make up a superhero and just be like, oh, do you have the newest issue of like Sponge Man or whatever? Like, <laughs> Super guy. I love that they bring up like young blood. Number one is pretty rare. And if you're a little kid, you'd be like, Oh my God, young blood. Number one. That's one. That's the first image comic ever published. And, and Savage dragon is just a violent comic where nobody yeah. learns a lesson. Like that is true for it. And Malcolm is clearly not used to having nice things or having his brothers ruin everything. So he's like, I can't even touch these. I, I'm not worthy to touch your comic books. Yeah, that's true. Stevie's an only child who he can, keep all of these comics uh, from being destroyed and has his own closet to keep comic books in like malcolm could never dream of those things well it seems both nice and realistic because uh mm. you know the way that they would find common ground would be that they could sit there reading comic books in silence for hours and hours and hours and have that be like a wonderful shared experience in part because they don't have to communicate and when you're that age you don't want to talk you know yeah. talking if you can get away with it uh so yeah that, that definitely felt like you know they could be together separately alone reading comics at the same time that was a very uh truthful and again i just feel like so much of this just rings true and that was definitely one element like that and uh, th that was basically my exact closet as a kid except <laughs> my comics were pretty much all spider-man comics you would have some savage dragon but <laughs> i i see now that i'm more stevie than malcolm in this show <laughs> next morning it's a saturday morning and it is realistic that a bunch of boys would hang out in their just underwear watching cartoons on Saturday morning. But I do now I just feel uncomfortable for the child actors being asked, like, yeah, hey, I'll be filmed in your underwear. It's not even, I think they're filmed very carefully not to even really show anything, but it's just, it. I feel weird for the, uh, the kid actors now. Yeah, but that also felt very realistic, Absolutely. you know, and especially if you're, if you're, if you're, uh, yeah, you, you, you do what, what you have to do. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the lack of modesty is very important for this family. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm sure I walked around in my underoos all the time watching cartoons. So, well, modesty is a luxury. Oh you yeah, know? well, yeah. modesty is not a luxury that these people have. And it's not like Lois, uh, yeah. And so Lois in the background, she's just walking around topless. I it's... forgot about like the all the mom duty in this episode, <laughs> and it goes on for quite a long time in this scene. And I, but I think it really just is like I am washing every top I own because I got to do it all at once. And maybe she only owns one bra, so she's just <laughs> like, "Look, I'm washing my one bra, okay." Uh, she's and she doesn't seem to mind. The kids are also like, eh, who cares? Like my topless mom. Who That's cares? like super brave of her, of, of Jane Kaczmarek too for this first episode. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure she was taped up, you know, in the in certain places, but still to d just go for that in your first episode. Uh, and uh, that's when she gets a call from Francis in our one real Francis scene of the episode. Hey, Francis, how's school? Oh, couldn't be better, Mom. My new roommate showed me how to kill mice with a hammer yesterday. So, you know, between that and the general atmosphere of simmering homoeroticism, I think I'm really starting to turn around. Well, honey, it's only until summer. Come on! Push it! Give it up, prom date! <laughs> yeah, listen, um, I know I shouldn't ask, but would you be able to send me my allowance, like, couple weeks early because i kind of oh my god are you smoking what i can hear you smoking you're smoking aren't you mom i'm not smoking jeez after seeing the anguish your father and i went through to quit did any of that register with you okay listen uh, i'll talk to your dad maybe we can send you part of it honey i have to go i'm late for work i'll, I'll call you later okay thanks mom i love you oh i love you 
I like the realness of that. Like she didn't mean to hang up before saying I love you. She was super busy, but that's another of these moments that cuts, uh, that separates Francis and Lois's mm-hmm. characters. Like Francis thinks, oh, she hung up without saying I love you. I, I, I hate my mom. And then she's like, no, I just forgot. I was too busy. But they have this, it's just more drifting apart between them. The the Francis and Lois stuff is some of the best, like, character stuff in the whole series. Because, like, you can see Lois and Francis, they both push each other so far. But also that, like, Francis, he has an entire complex about, like, oh, you're out to get me. Everyone's out to get me. Like, it's also seeing a teen boy smoke on TV, like, is shocking to see now. It really is. Like... I mean, it was, again, realistic. But, but That's something else I don't think stuck in the series. Like, all of their, like, most brash stuff is really up front. That would get a little bit softer. Just a little bit softer in the series. His smoking definitely goes away, yeah. Uh, I was that's one of the things about, like, watching movies from the 1970s and 1980s. You see characters smoking on an airplane or smoking in a restaurant. It seems like coming from science fiction. <laughs> you know, like, that seems as, as, as hard to believe as something in Star Wars. It's like, wait, people used to be able to smoke anywhere they want. Like, how how did that possibly happen and uh, tarantino movies he still they still smoke quite a lot in it which makes him feel special in a way sometimes well you won't see that filth on netflix oh, yeah, smoking so. is only shown when it's plot important <laughs> for the kids oh uh, thank god uh, but uh, yes, as Francis gets off the phone, the kids that I love that a doorbell ringing just starts a fight. Like Lois just says, like, someone get the door. Like, you get it. You get it. And they completely forget about the door and they are just hitting each other. It's yeah. Just... Well, it's like Reese and Malcolm are like rolling around on the ground and Dewey's just like whacking the ball of people yeah. <laughs> as it rolls around. Uh, and just screaming and just having. And then poor, uh, you see here, like this scene, what you see, like Lois doesn't. She doesn't want to be a tyrant of the house, but like these boys are completely uncontrollable and it seems like she has no other option than just trying to rule in fear. It's all it's all she's got. Uh, but she is confronted at the door by the Krellborn teacher and uh, Lois and the teacher have a funny relationship. I, there's a good moment later in season one where they're hanging out together and she's like the teacher tells lois oh i've learned so much from you or like i i see now i i underestimate what kids are but i like how uncomfortable the teacher is at just seeing her boobs and she's like <laughs> please put on a top she's like what yours are probably better than mine <laughs> and i also like that when lois first thinks that uh, malcolm's going to be put in a remedial class she's like why do you have to put labels on everybody and then the next scene she's like he's gifted exactly what a yeah. great label <laughs> but you can see how immediately defensive she is so she loves her kids yeah oh she's so defending of her kids she's she is the only one who gets to torture them like the world and it's only to toughen in her mind she tells you like i want you to just be tougher for the world that'll treat you way worse than me uh and so after she gets the news from uh the from the teacher and puts a shirt on uh it kind of fades to black for a commercial which is also not how the show is edited most of the yeah. time usually the act breaks uh, are always signify with the door slamming noise yeah yeah but, uh, then it comes to dinner time and another thing it's like all these actors are just chowing down like they're really eating they're not like playing with their food or whatever it's, it's another echo of the simpsons just like a lot of slop yes, and noisy yeah. eating <laughs> just a giant pan of macaroni they're all and white bread just like oh like yeah it's a very simple meal they're having and uh this is when lois reveals to everyone malcolm's gift i thought we weren't going to mention aunt helen until after the biopsy it's not that it's about malcolm i didn't do it you see it i saw him (laughs) a teacher from school came by and she ran some tests with malcolm he has an iq of 165 who malcolm (laughs) He's, a He's going to special class. What? Malcolm special? Where do you think that came from? They have a special program for kids <laughs> children. They have advanced textbooks and devoted teachers and all sorts of good things they don't want to waste on normal kids. You start on Monday. You're going to put him in the Krailboy class? Mom, no! I don't want to. What are you talking about? Of course you want to. No, I want to stay in my own class. I don't want to be a Krailboy. Mom, seriously, Krailboys get their butts kicked. Oh, wait, just stop one minute. I I love 
the statement of not wasting it on normal kids that like that that is kind of a problem with gifted classes yeah, yeah. i mean mine were held in a trailer outside of school for some reason the gifted kids had to get, get off the property to be yes. taught properly and it's like oh the computer and the trailer was better the books were better like the games you all played were better just like wow and then you go back to school like this is all trash yes yeah uh, well i think this sort of this sort of captures the way that uh, when you're of this age of being uh extremely intelligent makes you different and it makes you special not necessarily in a good way Mm -hmm. and not necessarily in a way that you will be embraced you're more likely to be mocked and ostracized it's kind of a uh it's an albatross uh, as much as it's something to be proud of a kind of in our society and and i like lois's defensiveness too she's like you have to do this because we have never been handed an advantage ever like you so take advantage of this like we're never given a good thing you're finally being given a good thing yeah like the finale of the show is just like an echo of this where she's like no you are going to college and here is your life like here i planned your life out for you this is how you're going to become successful yeah it's i see the clip on on twitter because they're all just like covered in mud yeah and uh it's it's a great clip i mean it also echoes the feeling as a kid where you're just like no please i don't want to do this in school or i don't want to do thing x and a parent just goes like well too bad the end and like it i think uh munez is really good at showing off his frustration at the whole thing and his distaste for that buffalo metaphor he's like what yeah (laughs) and then comes like the most acting that brian cranston gets to do in this episode which is still him being like nothing like that he's a just a vanilla force of uh, who just gives up everything to his wife uh but uh it's a speech about iced tea we have to do what's best for you mom please don't make me go please malcolm calm down but it isn't fair that's right it isn't fair It's the first time anyone in this family has ever been given an edge, and you are not going to waste it. Dad. Honey? Look, honey. Malcolm. (laughs) You see... For crying out loud, how come there's never any iced tea in this pitcher? I make a fresh (laughs) batch every morning. It's gone by the time I get home. (laughs) <laughs> he's just fully distracted by his empty mm-hmm. pitcher of iced tea and like hal is more active in other i i kind of like how hal kind of grows into like oh this is where the boys get it from because he also likes to make trouble in some episodes he's just as much trying to get away with things for uh, away from things with lois as the kids are though also i love that he's written as like constantly horny like, yes yeah <laughs> that they there's a bit i had forgotten about where he like had a bad day and he's saying he's not in the mood and then lois is like you're always in the mood and he's <laughs> like no i'm not just a machine yes you are and like i can't get I ready at a, at a snap of your fingers yes you can right now <laughs> and then he's like oh all right you're right it explains them the many children (laughs) yes yeah they with more to come (laughs) they also argue in the show that their lives would be way better if they would stop fucking but they just can't they they're like two to i think in one episode (laughs) hal says they do it twice a day every every day uh but yes the uh that scene ends with a cute little scene of malcolm being comforted by lois it lets you see there's some vulnerability to the character she's not just an enforcer and you can it's a it feels like a moment given to let you know like lois loves her kids too she's not she doesn't just hate being a mother or is tortured by it also i can only notice in this hd viewing of it of like oh he has malcolm has savage dragon posters on his wall it was I, true I like that yeah he loves that dragon and uh yeah it's, it's a cute little speech he gives about like hey you know there's those ugly kids next door and these dumb kids you're better than them you you deserve this and and i also do love that she says like nobody will treat you different instant cut to his teacher going like and he's different and better (laughs) than all of you every single (laughs) one of you you know when i had my gifted class i did have a teacher who i had a regular teacher who she didn't like us going to gifted and kind of complained out loud about how it was a waste and how it was a, a bad program which i mean just bring that up at your meetings lady don't put it on the kids that's that's how i look back on that like maybe there's you can there's there's things you can say wrong about gifted classes but it's don't complain to a child about <laughs> it's always gifted. the children's fault isn't it seymour <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I had a uh, guy when I was in seventh grade in Chicago. I remember a, a particularly misguided teacher being like, oh, you guys will make fun of Nathan. and You, you bully him and you treat him differently. But if he grows up, he's going to be so much more successful than all of you. He's going to be like a lawyer, a writer. He's going to make so much money. and You're going to feel so bad for you know mistreating him and you could just see them getting angrier and angrier and be like oh so now you're saying that he's better than us like we're gonna beat him twice as hard and in your name you you bastard you yeah i, I had teachers thinking that was a a positive thing yeah. as well yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, it turns out all your bullies are successful because that's what you need to succeed in business. Yeah, cruelty. <laughs> Every boss I ever had was uh, the majority of bosses I had were like, "Oh, you were a bully. You threw yourself like they always tell you, like, oh, your bully's going to grow up to be washing cars.' It's like not if your bully goes to a specific college and is in the same frat with a bunch of other guys who all just hire each other into every job. Then they might run every website and <laughs> uh, ruin them. That might happen. Not that uh, although I did, I, I did appreciate. Uh, that she says that if you're a loser, you're going to end up working at a at a uh, car wash, uh, considering what Brian Cranston would do in uh, uh, mm. Breaking Bad, and where uh, he ended up making some of his money. Uh, the one not uh, directly related, I guess not. It is right because you were laundering money through yeah, the car wash. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that would just seem like a, like a weird, uh, weird coincidence that she would single that out. Yeah, and Lois is like a a clerk at like a Walgreens, so yes, there's a bit yeah. of self loathing there. Like, don't end up like me in the like a dead end, go nowhere job. Almost. There is a great joke about her job when she loses it. That like Malcolm just says the thing any kid is thinking. Like, can't you get unemployment? Didn't I hear about that? And she says, Well, I work 38 hours a week, so technically I'm part time. <laughs> it's like, damn, damn, a show joking about that like is is crazy but so then malcolm heads to the uh, the krell boy in class where he is i can't i keep wanting to say krell born but it's krell boyne and uh and you, you see his other classmates but none of the regulars will be in yeah. the show uh which includes dabney which is i think the character that was most like me the <laughs> child me the he's the glasses wearing artistic one of the group uh but i i love malcolm's delivery of like so i'm the freak of the freak freak show that's uh and and here's malcolm being like straight up bad why do they keep doing it? you're new oh great so i'm the freak of the freak show just chill out don't tell me to chill out you chill out nobody can live like this i'm okay oh sure you're okay because it doesn't make any difference to you you've always been a freak i used to be normal wait who just said that <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna take that the wrong way, aren't you? You suck. I like that. Yeah. I like uh, Stevie. It shows that Malcolm, like, you know, Malcolm, you're being an asshole too here. <laughs> a, a lot of the series is about how uh, Malcolm needs to be humbled because mm -hmm. he is too smart for his own good and it makes him think he's better than people. Yeah, he he has too high of an opinion of himself sometimes and needs to be brought down. I I loved in the, uh, in the episode where she loses her job that the shame he feels about being poor and when his classmates decide to help him with a food drive and he's just <laughs> more humiliated by it it's really great and then he just screams about like yeah i don't like being poor is that so wrong like and then even after people helped him he's like you know stop feeling sorry for me okay i don't care that you help me it's just he's he's really good at delivering just that anger at, at everything uh so we come to the final scene of the episode where uh, it's at recess we hear the recurring song by citizen king better days <laughs> and the bottom drops out i'm a bad 90s kid i thought this was sublime I had to look this one up, honestly. I thought I thought it was for a second the butterfly song. Oh, okay. Yeah, but... uh, I was actually and this is again, this is the world that I came up with. Uh they were a Wisconsin band. Uh, uh this is in King, if I'm not mistaken, from yes. Milwaukee. I believe so yeah that definitely digs you right back to the year 2000 and not only was uh our, our fashion all time low but our pop music also was spectacularly stupid and cheesy and terrible as as and also kind of great at the same time uh, I take it that Citizen King has not played the gathering at any point <laughs> no 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 
<laughs> Not to say they've seen better days. Oh, uh, the song was true. Uh, this this uh, song would recur a lot in the series. I think they just liked it as a good tone setter. And I'm also just so impressed with like they have an overhead shot of like dozens of child extras. Like this had to be r- way more expensive than any random episode of that '70s show, you know. Well, apparently this won the Emmy for Best Writing and Best Direction. Uh, Deservedly <laughs> so. Yeah. As pres- prestigious as you can get. And there's also, as often tends to be the case, uh, tend to be for the uh, best and then also the most. Because this is a very written, very directed show. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, there's just something very wonderfully dynamic about it. And it really does, I guess, kind of presage all, a lot of the shows that would follow, like your Arrested Development. Mm-hmm. which obviously learned a lot uh, from the show and the way that it kind of broke free from the whole kind of visual format and the visual vocabulary of what it means to be a television sitcom. It set the tone for single camera comedies, at least on network for the next 20 years. Like I, like I said, the Larry Sanders show does predate it as a single camera comedy of that generation. But I think this for mainstream, this really set the tone of what, a, what this, how you tell those jokes and stories. Well, that was kind of a, a bit of a mockumentary type thing mm. where this is obviously engaging. I also thought it was interesting that uh, I felt like there were a lot of Jim Halpert looks uh that malcolm gave you know that whole idea of i have this relationship with the audience and with the camera that nobody else has yeah it's nice that he can do it instead of everybody doing it like every other sitcom like what i mean that modern family cheats it the most of like well okay are you a documentary who are you talking to or i guess you know parks and rec cheated it quite a lot too yeah the 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 conceit of the documentary falls away after three years you know but in malcolm they don't even explain it like yeah he can talk to the tv no character can else no one sees him talking out loud it's just his inner monologue said to people out loud he's a witch secretly <laughs> and also, I, I feel like kind of the implication of a lot of his looks are can you believe what i have to deal with yeah yeah uh, <laughs> but what hmm. did you hear that too yeah he's good at the hapless look yes yeah uh so malcolm is on edge he finally tries to apologize to stevie but that's when the bully comes back and i like that malcolm when he snaps at the bully he not only is like mean to him he hurts the bully's feelings which actually (laughs) that's what pushes him over the edge would you call me you heard me i don't care anymore i just don't care spat okay all you ever do is make everybody miserable except for you little monkey slaves over there who by the way only pretend to like you they hate you as much as everyone else does and you're just too busy being mean and stupid to ever figure it out i keep trying to run but my legs won't work (laughs) <laughs> Mom was right. They are important. <laughs> wow. Well, I don't know about you, but the Krell boy really hurt my feelings. <laughs> hey, go away, Stevie. It's good you two are friends. You won't mind sharing his wheelchair. Okay. This is where something good happens. Finally. So we're going to slow down and make it last as long as possible. <laughs> And then comes the They Might Be Giant song, Pencil Rain, mm. which uh, is not even one of their, like, C-level songs. I feel like you have to be a mega <laughs> fan to know the Pencil Rain song. Uh, but when I heard it in 2000, I was like, oh, my God, I never thought I'd hear this They Might Be this song on television. And uh, and also that Malcolm calls out the slow-mo coming. Is, is, yeah. That's fun, too. It's, it's a nice way because it's like you get all this wall breaking, but he's like, I can control the reality of the scene to, like, really make this good for you, the viewer. It, it borders on Zen. Zach abilities yeah. <laughs> throws putting in the face of spath spath then takes a big swing too far and even though he l- loosened his fist to not actually punch him it just taps stevie's chin and stevie takes advantage of the situation and pretends to be knocked unconscious and spath is destroyed yeah. by that that's even he went uh, too far that's so <laughs> it's so great like because this this resolution here fits so many malcolm in the middle resolutions which is the system fails them at every turn living within the system fails them the only way they succeed is by breaking the rules themselves and like cheating the system in a way which includes stevie like 
taking advantage of his position yeah. as a disabled kid to destroy the life of a bully who deserves it. And the epilogue is about how, like, here's the big lie we told to yes. get out of this, and it worked. Uh, and and I love the like Spath, like he his life is ruined because you know you're allowed to pick on so many people but not a kid in a wheelchair like there's a level of morals <laughs> on the schoolyard that they that he broke it's very true uh and just so great that like stevie does that for him too that he fakes an injury and i'll let you know that stevie is a fun kid too that he's a rule breaker too as well he's not just a heavily protected kid by his his parents who keep him on a short leash yeah, I think, again, I feel like there's kind of uh, the impulse with a lot of shows like that. So they kind of make him noble. You got to make him a paper saint. And, like, look how he's suffering so uh, silently and heroically. And it's like, no, he can be a jerk. He can cheat. He can throw himself on the ground. Like, he's a human being. Mm -hmm. And that is a wonderful thing. And it's not disrespectful or offensive to uh, acknowledge and, and to understand somebody's humanity. And uh, then the ending comes with Malcolm doing a thing again. They kind of they didn't really do in other episodes, which is Malcolm fully talking to the audience and explaining everything else that happened, like basically him wrapping up the story here. So then the principal comes out and everyone's all talking at once. So the story he puts together is that Spath attacks Stevie for his lunch. And I'm like this hero that stepped in to defend him. It was beautiful. Okay, it wasn't funny when Spaz started crying. No, wait, it was. <laughs> Dad's hair. Ugh. Yeah, I know. It's gross. But hey, if a bunch of birds can make the best out of what they get, then so can I. Malcolm! Like having to go to special class. I can make it work out, right? Malcolm! Not now! Or my family. We're not the greatest family in the world, but we could get better. I mean, it's not impossible. Malcolm! What? Can I get out? No, stop asking! <laughs> so basically, I think everything's going to be okay. A bump on a nose. So what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> I like that he's actively being a bully while yeah. explaining how he, he like triumphed over the bully. It's great. That's, that is great, yeah. it's But hey, that's the rules. It's a little brother. It's what yeah. you, You're allowed to do that to your that's, little that's brother. That's what they're for. I was the little brother, so uh, injustice. I, I'm older brother position here, but... Uh, <laughs> The ending's cute, and I, I like you see the Dewey. The Dewey's under a trash can the whole time is, is funny. It adds extra humor to a basically just, and the moral of the story was mm -hmm. kind of delivery. And also how I do appreciate that Malcolm loves a bully's tears. I'm, I'm into that. <laughs> <laughs> but the show wouldn't really do post credit gags after this it's really just like That's slam it, yeah. to black end of episode like also the episode the pilot ends with them kind of like panning up to the sky and it's like uh like almost forrest gump style which the show didn't the show is about ending even the third act with like slam, slam door, door yeah, yeah. But uh, it's still a great... You can see why this won Emmys and all these accolades. Yeah. Like, this probably was the best pilot of that season. Like uh, I, yeah. I'm not a West Wing liker, so it's, <laughs> I, I'm going to say it's definitely better than that. I was like afraid to go back to Malcolm in the Middle because I enjoyed it so much, but I didn't know, like, is it a product of its time? Is it like too precious? Or does it think it's smart and it's really not? But I think after watching this pilot, I'm going to go into it and rewatch it as a fun quarantine challenge mm -hmm. or... Uh, uh, so like side quest or whatever because I was like oh man this is still really good and this is going to be my prestige television binge watch <laughs> over over the next however many months of quarantine there is but yeah I no Sopranos for you no Sopranos <laughs> this is this is a, the, the height of television as far as I'm concerned but yeah so good so good I'm so happy it still holds up well it just struck me as a show that knew exactly what it wanted to do and did it you know mm. Uh, it's very fully realized. Yeah, and I think it I think it brought up the game of The Simpsons too just by being next to it, you know. I think it it pushed them or it showed maybe too it hurt The Simpsons in that older viewers like us who were like, "Oh, I watched The Simpsons and I'm starting to get disappointed with some episodes then you see malcolm right after like oh is malcolm the better show now mm, i'm yeah. not used to i'm not used to liking a show on sunday night more than the simpsons but 
but that was the position I was in starting around season 13 of Simpsons, I think, or maybe even 12. But no, this was uh, such a great series that I think definitely is worth returning to. You know, obviously, look, I don't like Frankie Muniz's politics either, but if you can just see him as the cute young boy, <laughs> Malcolm, having adventures, uh, I, if you're to watch one other episode and you haven't watched it before, I do think that bowling episode might be the best one. Yeah, season two bowling. It's a high concept episode where you see it's sort of like a sliding door style scenario in which you see how a night goes, depending on which parent is in charge. Mm-hmm. It, the way they hand off different realities is very clever and well yeah. done. It won the Emmy. It's, it's fucking advanced chaos theory 12 years before community did their dice episode mm. yeah so though it's and i i dare say it's even more ambitious than just how it's filmed in split screen at a bowling alley with a ton of extras mm-hmm. like malcolm in the middle was not hurting for money as a show compared to community which uh, had worse budget every year they did the show and ratings <laughs> yep yeah but uh, Nathan, thanks so much for joining yes. us and sticking around for so long. Please plug everything you're doing. You're so busy. You got Patreon, podcast, a book that's out. Uh, please talk to our audience about I everything do, you're doing. I do. I will. I will very happily plug my various projects. Uh, my main thing is I have a website called Nathan Ravens Happy Place, where I write a whole bunch of stuff every single day. It's the home of my world of flops. On uh, my column that is currently in its thirteenth year of existence, Ooh. where I write about the very worst of everything. And then I have a book called The Weird Accordion to Al, ridiculously self-indulgent ill-advised vanity edition it's a 500 page book about weird al yankovic's life's work with an introduction by weird al yankovic he also copy edited it he also fact checked it wow uh yeah 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 it's both because you know we worked together on his coffee table book weird al the book and then also he was horrified by my grammar uh <laughs> so those two things caused him to say i will uh, copy edit your book for free which wow. is very nice and it's 500 pages so that's an awful lot of copy editing then i also have a book called postal about the video game and movie postal and their creators oh. uh then stezzy the video game you eat bowl uh the movie i wrote that with my friend brock wilbur it's out on boss fight books and i've got a podcast called uh, travolta cage and in it me and my co-host clint worthington we go through john travolta and nicholas cage's filmography uh chronologically to determine who the better actor is spoiler it's nicholas cage uh-huh. a great deal oh my god he's amazing uh, and that's a lot of fun we're about I'm not quite halfway through the process. We're up to about Pulp Fiction. Mm. Uh, and uh, Pulp Fiction and uh, It Could Happen to You. Uh, Nicholas so, Cage yeah. is so thoroughly himself. Well, meanwhile, Travolta's always, you know, keeping it inside, yeah. keeping it in the closet, oh, perhaps. There's, there's a purity to Nicholas yeah. Cage. Whereas John Travolta, you know, he's kind of wrapped up in this idea of who he should be as opposed to who he actually is. Mm -hmm. So that kind of tension makes him interesting, but not as compelling or as pure a performer as Nicolas Cage. You know, I'd be worried about having Weird Al copy edit my book because I'd fear he'd spoof me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thankfully he did not. (laughs) It would be an honor of a lifetime if he were to write some sort of... uh, that, that would be insanely meta if he wrote a parody of a book that was written about him. <laughs> well, we will release you back to the uh, the custody of your children at this point. Yes. <laughs> All right. I also have a family that I need to pay attention to now. <laughs> so yes. thanks so much for having me, guys. Yeah. Oh, thank you, too. So thanks again to Nathan Rabin for being on the show. He's one of our personal heroes. Always so great to have him on. Please check out all of his stuff. But as for us, if you want to check out more of our stuff and get all these episodes one week ahead of time and ad free, please go to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Sign up there for five bucks. You'll get just that, but also access to everything behind the $5 paywall. That includes all the stuff we've done behind the paywall for the past three plus years. You get access to that instantly. Over 100 podcasts. Too many to list here, but the most recent thing that we did behind the paywall is Talking Mission Hill, our exploration of the Mission Hill series across 14 or maybe 15 episodes. I forget. We did a few more past the run of the series, including a look at the lost episodes in an interview with uh, Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein. That's all located on uh, patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. But if you sign up for 10 bucks a month, you get all of the $5 stuff plus one mega long podcast once a month, only for patrons of that level or higher. And what is that, Henry? Why you're talking about the what a cartoon movie podcast where me and Bob talk about an animated feature film in the same way we talk about the Simpsons and animated TV shows on what a cartoon recent ones have included space jam, the black, cauldron and ending out this last month in august we did the 1995 anime classic ghost in the shell you sign up 
at the ten dollar level you get all that five dollar stuff bob mentioned and over a hundred hours now of what a cartoon movie greatness where we talk about a different movie sign up now ten bucks a month for the premium level at patreon.com slash talking simpsons so I've been one of your hosts, Bob Mackey. You can find me on Twitter as Bob Servo. My other podcast is Retronauts. That's a classic gaming podcast about old video games. Find that wherever you find podcasts or go to patreon.com slash retronauts and sign up there for two exclusive episodes every month at patreon.com slash retronauts. Henry, how about you? Why I'm Henry Gilbert. Follow me on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G to stay up to date with all the cool stuff going on with me. And if you want to stay up to date with this podcast and its sister podcast, you should follow at Talk Simpsons Pod on Twitter. At Talk Simpsons Pod on Twitter. You'll know when new episodes of Talking Simpsons, what a cartoon, and all of our exclusives go up on the free feeds or on Patreon. If you follow that on Twitter, please do at Talk Simpsons Pod. Thanks so much for joining us, folks. We'll see you next time for the Simpsons episode Faith Off, and we'll see you then. And I just can't say enough about how proud we should all be of Malcolm for getting into the gifted program. Now, Malcolm may not look different than the rest of us, but he is very different in his brain. And I think we should recognize him for that. Bye.